Hello and welcome to this webinar on COVID-19 vaccination in children. I'm Fiona Godley, Editor-in-Chief of the BMJ and on behalf of the BMJ, the University of Bristol, the University of Newcastle, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the webinar. Uh, this series of webinars stems from an editorial we published in the BMJ back in October last year uh, by George Davy Smith and Marcus Manafo. Uh, which was called COVID-19 Known Unknowns. Um, and the subtitle was, the more certain someone is about COVID-19, the less you should trust them. And the editor will express concern about the polarization of debates and hardening of positions on key issues uh, that were making it hard to make progress on the science and the practice of handling the pandemic. And it called on us all to move away from certainty and to respect uncertainty. Uh, it said that acknowledging uncertainty a little more might improve not only the atmosphere of the debate and the science, but also public trust. And that is the spirit of this series of webinars. As I say, today's webinar is on COVID vaccination in children, uh, certainly not an uncontentious topic. Uh, previous topics have been children and schools, testing and asymptomatic people, vaccines, zero COVID, new variants, long COVID, COVID and mental health, uh, and others, all of which are available on the BMJ's YouTube channel, where this webinar will also be posted. And just to say that this webinar is also being live streamed on BMJ uh, YouTube channel, which you can find if you're finding difficulty accessing us, uh, youtube.com forward slash the BMJ. The next uh, webinar in this series will be in four weeks time in, on the 7th of October, and also on a not uncontentious topic, uh, the origins of COVID-19. So I hope you will join us for that as well. We've got our largest ever registration numbers for this particular webinar. We've got over 3,600 of you registered to join from all around the world. We've got some great speakers. We've got great chairs. The timing is going to be quite tight because we've got a lot to get through. Uh, we want this to be as interactive as possible. So please do tweet using the hashtag COVID unknowns and um, also send us your questions via the Q&A function. And we will put as many of those as possible to the speakers in the discussion at the end which will be chaired by Phil Hammond. And I'm delighted now to hand over to Phil to open the webinar. Phil. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fiona. Delighted to be here again for what promises to be a really enthralling uh, session. Uh, in terms of the questions, I'll be uh, chairing the questions at the end at around 5.55. Please put your name to any questions that you ask through the chat function. We'll only uh, be asking authored questions. Um, I work in paediatrics. I'm an uh, associate specialist in paediatric fatigue at the IUH in Bath. So I'm delighted that we're kicking off uh, with uh, a wonderful uh, title, Rights of the Child and the Voices of Children and Young People, clearly central to this debate. So kicking us off is Katie Parsons from the University of Hull. Over to you, Katie. Thank you. I'll just get my screen up now for you. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the introduction, Phil, and also the invitation um, to come to speak to you today. I'm here to advocate and um, incorporate children's voice into the COVID-19 vaccine debate. So 2019 will go down in history of being the year that saw the start of the largest ever youth movement. However, just one and a half years later, and the millions of politically active young people are virtually absent from the pandemic debates and political decisions. Beyond the climate movement, I would argue that when it comes to the coronavirus, there's been a systematic underrepresentation of young people throughout the pandemic, and COVID has impacted the opportunity for young people to participate. A child's right to participation, voice and agency began to emerge in the 1980s and was crystallised in 1989 United Nations Conventions on the Right of a Child. All countries globally, bar one, have ratified this convention and are thus committed to having children's rights at the core of their values. As such, the UNCRC has influenced laws in the UK with the development of legislation like the Children's Act and Every Child Matters Initiative. In fact, the Scottish Government this year became the first in the UK to begin to fully incorporate the Convention into law. The UNCRC itself, however, is just the start of putting young people at the heart of the agenda, and in the context of today's discussion with the COVID vaccine debate. As you can see here, I've highlighted several UNCRC articles that we should be adhering to regarding policies on the vaccine when considering children and young people. 
But there are many more I could have highlighted that are very relevant when we look at the hidden impacts COVID has presented over the last 18 months. In a recent Growing Up Under COVID survey, researchers at the University of Huddersfield wanted to understand how 14 to 18 year olds were experiencing and responding to the COVID crisis. A few of the most interesting findings are summarised here and drawing your attention to the final point that young people want to be part of the government plan for a COVID recovery. These findings have also been echoed through a comprehensive study that was led by the Centre for Children's Rights at Queen's University Belfast. They consulted over 26,000 children and young people globally and specifically looked at how children's rights have been impacted during COVID around the world. Although I don't have time to go into the details, but I have picked a few of the highlights that include the unanswered questions children had for their governments. So how does this work in healthcare? Well, thinking about under the COVID vaccine, just under a month ago, the new NICE guidelines for babies, children and young people's experience in healthcare came out. This was developed in consultation with young people. I know this because my daughter was lucky enough to be part of that panel. When you look at the summary slide here, I think it once again highlights the need to include young people in this debate. Just look at the words that are used. Involve me, talk to me, respect me, help me understand. I think this really shows how communicating with children and young people is absolutely central to effective healthcare. Which brings me to the end of my presentation and the last thoughts being those from those who matter the most. These are just a few of the many questions that young people have about the vaccine. And as I've shown through the presentation, children and young people have a right to be heard, to ask their questions and to receive information so that they can make an informed choice. I'll now share with you three questions from Elodie, Kit and Keris. Hello. My name's Elodie Hoban and I am worried about how the media is portraying it that young people should get vaccinated to protect older people irrespective of the questions raised about the potential health risks to us and why is this okay? If I don't take up the offer, will my vaccine be given to someone in another country who needs it more? Will we be allowed to choose for ourselves and make informed decisions as to whether or not we want to get the vaccine? Thank you and I'll hand you back over to Phil. It's actually George I think is going to take over now but yeah. thank you very much for that Katie. Over to you George for the next session. Thanks Phil. Yeah so and, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Russell Viner from Great Ormond Street Hospital and University College London and he's going to lay out the key issues in childhood vaccination for COVID. Thank you, George. I think, I hope people can hear me. I'm just sharing my screen. Okay, is that visible? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. And it's always good and really important to follow the children and young people's voices because they certainly need to lead us. So I was going to talk through some key issues for childhood vaccination. Much of the detail you will hear from experts in following sessions. I will try not to, um, to uh, repeat what they're going to say. Now, firstly, I just wanted to continue the theme about uncertainty and the best interest of the child. Um, the previous uh, presentation has already mentioned the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child requires us to act in the best interests of a child. Ethically, this must be paramount over the interests of others, of broader society. And much of this discussion is going to be about balancing some of those risks. And I'll come back to that in one minute. But I think this changes what I would call the safety bar for vaccination, because one of the questions is, are we if we vaccinate children, do we do it for them or are we in part vaccinating for others? And if we do do that, then it's a reasonable thing to do and we'll come back to that. I think that very much changes the, and uh, raises the bar in terms of side effects and safety. Now, this has become quite a polarized debate. And I'm saying both sides, I think there are more than two sides, but anyway, both sides have argued 
and they've used the best interests of the child in their arguments. We have claims that it's the best interest to both be vaccinated and to never be vaccinated. One argument suggests that vaccination of adults has led to children being the only large unvaccinated group in the population, which is both a risk to the population, but also leaves children unprotected and excluded from protection and freedom. Others argue that there are too many unknowns, that the benefits are too marginal for us to be truly acting in the best interest of children by moving now. Um, so I will look at some of this data. Now, I first wanted to quickly start by reminding you, for those who are not pediatricians, about SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 uh, infection in children and teenagers. The great majority, well, the majority, have no or minimal symptoms when they're infected. Classic COVID-19 disease, the kind of condition we see in adults, um, and I'm showing you a picture of a more severely affected child here, does occur with fever, sepsis and shock and respiratory distress, cough, et cetera, but it's relatively rare. Well, it is rare, we'll come back to that. There is also a condition called pediatric multisystem inflammatory syndrome in this country, also called MISC-C uh, elsewhere, which is a post-infectious or a, a, the body's response to infection that occurs approximately six weeks after um, SARS-CoV-2 infection and presents with inflammation of many systems, particularly rash, um, possibly joints, potentially cardiac uh, inflammation. Now, that, those are the direct impacts of COVID, but it's really very important to remember that the major impacts of COVID on children and young people in this country and internationally have largely been the indirect impacts. What people have called the shadow pandemic, impacts on mental health, the social exclusion, the shutting down of children's lives that we have done, closing schools, closing their lives, essentially to benefit adults. Let's be clear about that. The loss of transitions and opportunities in education and the loss of economic opportunities, particularly for young adults. We need to very much remember that in all of this balance, which we, in our adult way, focus on the adult issues of severe illness and vaccination. Now, moving on swiftly, um, vaccination is a routine in child health. This is the England vaccination schedule. You probably can't read all of it. It's just meant to impress you with its breadth. Um, vaccinations are a routine part of healthcare for children and young people. They are, we have very well established ways of assessing their benefits and risk. And the JCVI um, is actually exceptionally good at this, that they usually don't do this within the spotlight that has been focused on some of these decisions about vaccinations of children. Most vaccines are given in early childhood. However, adolescent vaccination has very much taken off in the past decade. And just one, one point, there are a number of diseases here that we vaccinate for where we vaccinate children or teenagers to protect others. The majority of these, we vaccinate them to protect themselves, but there is also a strong focus on herd immunity, building up population resistance and protecting others. And that may be particularly true of rubella, which in children is a very mild disease in general, but of course is very, very problematic for pregnant women. And for um, human papilloma virus, HPV vaccination in boys. Um, so they're relevant, I think, to our future debate. Now, it's very important that we think about vaccination decision-making frameworks. It is not enough to claim it's obvious we should be vaccinating children because of the terrible harm COVID does, or it's obvious we shouldn't because of the risk of myocarditis. Decisions around vaccines um, are clearly take into account disease impact and population risk but you need to think carefully about characteristics of the vaccine, about how they might be delivered to any new population. And there's a whole series of issues about how one might vaccinate children and teenagers. The cost effectiveness questions, interestingly, seem to have gone largely out the window uh, when we talk about COVID vaccination. Safety, I didn't jump over it because of course that's an absolutely key one here. But as well as that, 
there were contextual constraints and facilitators. Acceptability, are all stakeholders on board? And actually a real question, do children and young people want the vaccine? Which is a slightly different question to whether their parents want them to have it. And I think number four here is very important. Priority in the context of other public health interventions. Let us be clear, we do nothing in a vacuum. If we vaccinate our children and young people, that will inevitably displace investment in something else that could have, and we, we need to consider the balance of when and how we do those things. Perhaps more on that in a minute. Now, you will hear much more data later on from experts in the field. Just a pointer here, we have some trial data, what I would probably call efficacy data, on can it work in adolescence and is it broadly safe? We have some data on adolescence, on safety. There's been about 10 million teenagers vaccinated now. But we are largely lacking data on effectiveness of the vaccine in adolescence in the population. Does it work to reduce transmission? Does it work to prevent disease? We have very little data on that. And we essentially have no data on children under 12. Trials are in, underway and you will hear about those. But the our level of uncertainty here is very, very, very high. Okay, now I wanted to start and spend a bit of time um, on risk balances. And you will hear more on each of these areas from experts as we go through. I've written, shown you a sort of double um, set of balances here or teeter totters. One I think is about the balance of risks between the individual and broader society. And the individual here is a child. And I think this really takes us back to the question whose interests are paramount, the child or broader society? And I think the UN Convention is very clear on that, but anyway. Within each of those, for the individual or for broader society, there is a risk benefit set of uh, analyses that we need to think through. And I wanted to think through some of those questions with you uh, today. So clearly, protection from infection, protection from the direct risks of COVID is something that vaccines can do. Um, now, the risk of death, we have data from the first pandemic year in this country, which was uh, yeah, through to about um, February, March this year. There were 25 deaths of children and young people under 18 in this country. At about the same time, there were, I think, about over 120,000 adult deaths. That figure alone tells you, in many senses, the extreme age sensitivity of this infection and shows you how potentially marginal some of the benefits may be. However, let us be clear, the death of any child is one death too many. What's very important is that we recognize that the great majority of those deaths were in those who had severe comorbidities or other chronic conditions. And these are children and young people that sadly can be carried off any winter by any virus. COVID did more than any virus. There's no pretense it is just another virus, of course not. But the groups that are vulnerable have been vulnerable in previous years. Actually in healthy, I say those without serious comorbidities, the risk of death is very, very low. Um, there were, the number of deaths was very, very low and particularly the, the group that we're talking at the moment about vaccinating 12 to 15 year olds, very few, I think two. Severe disease again, much more common. And we've, the severe disease, the proxy we have is into admission to pediatric intensive care. But again, very, very rare um, in terms of the whole population. I think it's important to say, because someone will ask, someone will say, hasn't Delta changed all of this? And the answer is, we don't believe so. Delta is undoubtedly much more infectious. There is some evidence that it is, produces more serious disease in adults, but the, the evidence is not there for that in children. And in fact, I think there is a, a puzzlement amongst pediatricians across this country that we appear to have almost seen less severe disease um, with Delta, but that may be, of course, because uh, it's been over the summer. 
So analyses need to be done. Some data out yesterday from Australia again confirms they are not seeing any more serious disease with Delta. Okay. Now protection again from the semi-direct uh, impacts of infection from post-COVID syndromes. You will hear more about the prevalence and the impacts of post-COVID syndromes, but we have incredible uncertainty about how common they are. And in fact, we clearly have no definition <clears throat> of the post-COVID syndrome in children and young people. I put a prevalence figure in there. Uh, the 14% refers to the clock study recently uh, uh, um, published. The 14% is the difference between the cases and the controls, because we need to remember that many of these symptoms have a high prevalence amongst ordinary health, well, amongst those who are negative for COVID-19, who have never had an infection. So we can't just look at the symptom prevalence, we need to think more in a more sophisticated way. You, uh, you need to draw to close muscle. So uh, moving on, so protection from, um, protection from uh, indirect effects is a major issue. Now, others are going to talk about myocarditis um, and the risks of that. The loss of opportunity for natural immunity, interesting set of risks, reduced transmission. Um, George, are we ahead of time or have I been given an old, um, the, the, the list that I was sent around um, earlier had a different set of timings, but I will, uh, I will speed up and finish. The risk for transmission has not really, really been quantified. The risk of the, the benefits of reducing transmission reduces once adult vaccination is higher and once seroprevalence is higher in children. And our best estimates are somewhere between 20 and 40 percent for children and young people. But we need to recognize that there are a number of potential risks otherwise. In terms of risks of supply of vaccination to adults and for internationally, the disruption that producing a vaccination program may cause and paths not taken. Okay, just very quickly, I will finish here. Consent, confidentiality, hesitancy and consequences. The voices of children, young people, we've heard them today, they've largely been lacking in this conversation. If approved, will young people want it? Vaccine hesitancy appears high. Some data from, the, um, from a very large national mm -hmm. survey suggests possibly only around half of 12, 13 year olds will actually are willing to have a vaccine. What are the consequences if they enter the adult world of vaccine passports? And the issues around consent and confidentiality we need to be very careful about. So thinking about the best interests of the children must be our guide. And I will stop there, thank you. Thanks very much, Russell. That was a, a great introduction and uh, setting the scene for the remainder of this uh, webinar. And I'd like to move straight on to uh, Shoma's uh, Ladani from Public Health England and St George's Hospital, uh, who's going to talk to us about what do we know about SARS-CoV-2 infection and immunity in children. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, thank yes. you very much. I, I'm so sorry that my video is actually not working. I have no objections to keeping my video on. And in fact, it tells me it's on, but I don't think it's working. So I'll, I'm going to talk blind. I can see my slides and um, I've got the easy task of just talking to you about COVID and children. And I'm not going to be talking about vaccines because there are others in the panel who are going to do a better job than me. So my name is Shemes Ladani. I'm a pediatrician. I work at Public Health England, and I was responsible for the surveillance of SARS-CoV infections in children from the start of the pandemic. And I think what became very clear at the beginning of the pandemic is that children seem to be relatively spared from the severe and fatal effects of the virus um, early in the pandemic. And uh, people were getting very reassured about uh, children uh, not having to go through what the adults and the older adults did in the pandemic. But as a pediatrician and understanding how these viruses work, it was going to become very clear that once the adults are sorted, either through infection or vaccination, this is predominantly going to become a childhood disease, which is essentially where we are now. 
So it was very important to try and understand the risks of infection in children, their ability to develop immunity against the virus, and the robustness of that immune system to understand whether this is going to be a virus that will keep coming back every year, or whether this is something that will happen once and then uh, they will be protected for long. So um, the impact of school closures, I'm going to say very little on that because Russell covered it so well at the start of his talk. Um, the, what I am going to talk to you about is how children respond to the virus. And the first thing I wanted to mention is that children are just as likely to get infected as adults. This is just a picture of, of PCR tests done from the start of the pandemic till the, uh, till the most recent data, showing that at the beginning of the pandemic, only 2.6% of cases were in children, and in the end, it's about a quarter. Now, despite all the caveats of the testings and vaccines and so on, what this is telling us that early in the pandemic, uh, children were asymptomatic and less likely to get tested. But on top of that, uh, we do know that there were more shielded and sc schools were closed and therefore were really not exposed to viruses like the adults were at the start of the pandemic. And therefore, we underestimated their risk of infection. And this is important because as we opened up to society and children started going back to schools, I'm giving you one example of a New York City hospital uh, seroprevalence. What you do see is that the proportion of children who develop antibodies against the virus is not that different to the adults. And that suggests that children do get infected and they mount an immune response, which includes antibodies when they're infected. And uh, we have done a lot of work. I, I highly recommend the paper that is uh, currently in preprint and about to be published in Nature Immunology uh, with the first author uh, of Alex Dowell, where we have looked at antibodies in children up to 12 months of age. And what we do see is that children usually make better antibodies than adults after infection. And they appear to retain those uh, very, uh, uh, very functional antibodies longer than adults do, at least until the 12 month time span. We also find that they have an excellent uh, cellular response in terms of their T cells, and uh, their T cells are often better than adults. So what is becoming very clear is that children know how to uh, manage this virus and they develop immune responses that are at least as good as if not better than adults. Um, and not only that, what we find is that the, the antibodies of children who have been infected with the original SARS-CoV do very well against all the other variants as well, and at least as good as the adults. So it's not like they, they have a very restricted protection from the initial infection, which is what some of us were concerned about. So what about schools? The big, uh, the big discussion that has been going on globally, especially between Europe and the United States, is whether children should be allowed to go to school or not. And I'm giving you my interpretation of the UK data, and there are other interpretations that you may have heard of as well. But I'm going to try and talk you through the trend that we saw in England uh, since we started schools back in September. So. The first thing I wanted to point out is that when the schools began uh, in, uh, at the end of August, cases in children, which are the, the dark red lines, the secondary, primary and uh, nursery children, were already going up and they were following the trends in the adults, which are in the blue lines. And that trend continued during the first half of the term. And what you do see is large increases in adults and it lag, but increasing numbers of cases in children as well. And secondary school children had more than primary schools who had more than early years. And that trend seems to have stayed uh, virtually throughout the pandemic. Um, if you remember, we went into national lockdown in November. And what you saw is a rapid decline in adult cases. The blue line started going up very quickly. And that followed with the red lines that followed afterwards again, uh, suggesting uh, that you know the children's cases are very influenced by the community infection rates. And uh, most of you will remember that the alpha variant came out in at the end of November and early December, and the, most of the country was in lockdown and it was only the students who were going to school. So you saw massive increases across all age groups and especially in children because they were out in the community and were having a lot of contact with everybody uh, during that period. One of the key findings that we found very early on in the, in the pandemic, uh, as soon as the schools opened, is this very strong correlation between children and community infection risk. 
And that risk is also age dependent. So the highest risk and the highest correlation is with secondary school children and then primary schools and then preschools. And you can do that in a low community transmission week and you find very strong correlations. So if your community infection rates go up, then children will have much more infection. And you can do that in high community transmission as well. And you see exactly the same trends. It's just that the numbers get much higher because the risk of infection and transmission gets higher. And this is just a list of some of the uh, studies that I've been keeping an eye on, all demonstrating that when you look at infections in schools, the vast majority of infections in schools are due to multiple introductions of the virus by different children and staff that bring the virus in. When you look at studies that have gone into schools to try and determine whether an infected child or a, or a teacher has infected another staff member or a child, that risk of secondary transmission is very, very low and does not really exceed 5%. So the risk of passing the virus to somebody else in school is less than one in 20. And it's much lower when it's the child who's infected and tends to be higher when it's the teacher that's infected. And also the child to child risk of transmission is much lower than the risk of a staff member passing it to another staff member or to a child. And multiple studies have shown that, including the latest one from Australia, which is right at the bottom of the page, they have looked at schools when they reopen in July in, uh, with a Delta variant. And they found exactly the same thing. They found that the virus is very transmissible, but children do not get sick with it. And in-school transmission was 4.7%. But if a child took the virus home, then the risk to the family members was 70%. And that gives you an idea of how much less transmission there is in school compared to other uh, environments such as the household. One of the, one of the problems with many of the studies that I showed you is that uh, children get a lot of asymptomatic infection. And the only way to capture asymptomatic infection that we're aware of is to do blood tests to look at antibodies before and after. Because if a child or an adult develops antibodies against the virus, then uh, what happens is that uh, it means that the, the person was infected with the virus and it could be symptomatic or asymptomatic infection. And these are just four of the studies, that five studies here that I'm aware of that again show that when you do that in school settings, the amount of children and teachers who develop antibodies during a full term is actually minimal and quite consistent with the infection rates that we see with, with additional testing. And uh, some of you may be aware of this randomized control trial run by Team Peter, where they either allow children to go home if they've been exposed to the virus in school or remain in school and get tested regularly with lateral flow tests to look at their risk of infection. And what they found is that in both settings, whether they stayed in school or whether they went home, the risk of infection to others who might have been exposed to the virus was less than 2%. And despite all the caveats of the studies, this definitely tells us that what we should be doing is letting children stay in school, but encourage lots of testing where it's possible. And face masks has been uh, very contentious. I'm not going to talk much about it. There is a really nice study that was published by Lesler et al in Science. And what that, let, what that paper showed is that face masks is just one of many other mitigations that are important in schools and they have a part to play just like all the other mitigations, but there's no evidence that they have more benefit compared to many of the other mitigations that are already in place. Can so you draw, just, draw to a close, uh, Shamas? One minute. Uh, I just wanted to tell you where we're at since the schools reopened uh, during national lockdown in March. The reason I'm doing that is we were very fortunate in that the adults remained in lockdown during the emergence of the alpha variant, but the children went to school. The red circle that you see there shows a, a small peak in teenagers with the infection because we had lateral flow testing for 70% of all students who went to school. But that, that disappeared very quickly despite the kids being in school. And the blue circle over here is the period between mid-April and mid-May when adults remained in lockdown, but children were fully engaged in schooling and we saw virtually no increase in infections. And unfortunately, the only time the increase happened 
was when uh, we reopened into step three nationally and opened up our pubs and bars and restaurants and, uh, and uh, our shopping centers, which presumably gave children more opportunity to mingle with adults outside school and, and get the infection. So this is my concluding slide. Uh, school closures have a wider impact on, on children uh, other than loss of infection. Children are as likely to be infected as adults. Children develop very robust and persistent immunity against the virus. All the evidence suggests that the risk of infection in school premises is very low for staff and students and no higher than the community. And that this risk is very closely correlated to community infection rates. If we can keep our community infections down, then we can protect our schools. Vaccinating teachers and adult family members is going to be great benefit because we then have to let, worry less about the children bringing the virus uh, to, at home or into the community. And I'm not going to say anything about vaccinating children. This is not my work. This is a whole team of work uh, or, or a whole team at PHE that has been helping with the studies. And I thank you for your attention. That was great, Shamas. Thanks very much indeed. I'm going to move straight on to uh, Emma Duncan from King's College uh, London, uh, who's going to talk to us about post-COVID conditions in children. I apologize everybody I just realized you could not hear me because I was still on mute I apologize and I will now retry to share my slides again I know at this point in the pandemic we've reached the point that I think we're all very familiar with electronic issues even after practice so could I check are you able to see my slides in presentation mode at this stage yeah we can see it but it's not in presentation mode Okay, I'll try again. And now? Perfect. Thank you. And again, I apologize for this. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come to this. I have to say I'm very impressed at the, the philosophy here, and it's really a principle of charity about listening and being careful um, to be sure one understands everybody's point of view. And I have no conflicts today. Already, Russell has talked through the issues about SARS-CoV-2 infection in adults, and I put things up there with a median duration of 11 days and prolonged illness, and studies that we did earlier looking at adults from the COVID symptoms study showed the figures of about one in eight having symptoms for more than four weeks, about one in 20 for more than eight weeks, um, and less than one in 50 having duration more than 12 weeks. But in children, again, as Russell has already outlined, most children, many if not most children have either asymptomatic or very mild illness. And although, again, any death is one too many, fortunately, life-threatening illness and death are rare. So when we started to work in this area, the question we wanted to answer was, how many children have prolonged illness duration? And how does illness that is due to SARS-CoV-2 compare with illness from other infections? And this was work conducted by myself and all my colleagues on the slide. So we looked at the COVID symptom study, which had ethics initially to, uh, to, with adults, and then we received governments to be able to look at the data that was logged for children on their behalf. So this is the largest citizen science participatory study in the UK to date. And individuals could download an app on their phone and look at symptoms, either giving direct questions or looking at free text, as well as vaccination and healthcare access. And adults could report for anybody else, including their spouses and elderly relatives. And we got governments to look at the children and we looked at what happened after the schools reopened from the 1st of September, during which time there were further waves of pandemic. And the critical thing that enabled us to do this at this time was that testing was much more widely available than was early on in the pandemic, although it was still limited to people who had fever, cough or anosmia. We looked at children who are aged between five to 17 because these were school-aged children and we split them into younger or older cohorts acknowledging that not all older children are necessarily in school. And we considered our data until eight weeks after the peak 
positive date for the UK. So we can see we looked at children who considered who were positive of COVID-19 itself, which meant they had to have a positive test and their symptoms had to correlate around the time within one week before or two weeks after the test. Um, and I've got a list of the symptoms. If anybody's interested, I can put this into the blog subsequently. The symptoms were predominantly drawn from adult data. And we added a number of other questions from November, which weren't included in our main analysis. But again, I've got the data if people would like this later on. We also looked at what free text, what people were saying that wasn't captured in the questions. And we looked at when people first presented until they recovered. Um, and we allowed people to have a gap of up to seven days where we received no report. Um, and I'm not going to present this, but actually the data for children, whether they're tested positive or negative, were actually assiduously reported by parents. So we actually had uh, more or less a report every day for younger children and in four out of five days for older children. We looked at prevalence and duration and we looked at symptom burden. And we defined long illness more than 28 days or long illness of more than 56 days. We also did exactly the same thing in children who'd been tested but were negative for SARS-CoV-2. And I'd emphasize that they had to be symptomatic to be part of our study. And we, ran, we chose a randomly selected control cohort. So we found that the median illness duration in children was six days. It was shorter and younger compared to older children and it correlated with age. The median symptom burden in the first week was three symptoms overall, a little more in older children than younger. And the most common symptoms were headache and fatigue. And I've shown this in the diagram here with the headache and fatigue with the arrows at the top. After that, the, these most common symptoms changed a little in between the younger children and the older children. And I've highlighted them there with the differences in bold. And in the picture here, older children are in blue and younger children are in pink. If we looked at the symptom duration, down the bottom here is the number of symptomatic days. And you can see for most children, the duration of illness was actually quite short. And that included fatigue here and headache here. If we looked at those children who had illness that lasted more than four weeks, this was present in about 77 children. It was slightly more common, as you will see, in older children at 5.1% compared to younger children at 3.1%. The concern initially when we started this was that children who had symptoms would be, it would get worse and worse over time. And actually we found exactly the opposite. For these children, on average, they had six symptoms in their first week and eight symptoms over their entire illness. But by the time they got to day 28, for most children, things were improving. Now, obviously, a symptom burden isn't everything to do with this. One can have a broken leg and it can be very painful and you can't move it, and that's only two symptoms. But it does say that people weren't getting worse in time in terms of symptom numbers. And I'm going to show this in a heat map in the next diagram, including the most common symptoms. So this is our heat map here. And there's the picture for what was happening with fatigue for those children who had symptoms over 28 days, headache, anosmia, the lack of smell, and in red here, sore throat, with an, which was the fourth most common, but you can see it is declining with time. Only 25 of our cohort had children had illness for more than 56 days. Um, and again, the symptoms were not getting worse over time. And, there, for the, uh, and I think there was no statistical difference between older and younger, but this is, a, this is a, an issue. We looked specifically at neurological symptoms because these can particularly affect learning. And as I've mentioned, you know, headache and fatigue were the most common. The data for dizziness is presented there, but I've mentioned although those numbers, um, the, the numbers were, were, were sort of about 15% in younger and about 25% in older, the median duration was short. Similarly for confusion, the prevalence data is here and the median duration was two days in each. We did not do a formal statistical comparison of older and younger kids because it really wasn't very common in the older kids, in the children who had symptoms for more than four weeks. We also looked at brain fog and low mood. And in our data, although it was reported and I put the figures there, again, the median duration was not long in either group, one day and two days for brain fog and low mood there. We looked for a whole host of specific neurological symptoms in the free text and it was reported 
rarely. Where it's not put, where there isn't a number there, it means we did not see it reported. In the negative children, the median duration of illness was shorter. It was three days, uh, and that was statistically significant. And I've put the data for the, for the kids who actually had COVID in, in grey there. The most commonly reported symptoms are push in bold headache and fatigue, showing the correlation of these symptoms compared to the children who were, who were positive for SARS-CoV-2. Few of these children had illness for more than 28 days, but for those children, and there was a handful of them, but for those children who were sick for more than 28 days, they had a greater symptom burden than did those children who had confirmed COVID-19. This is the symptom due. This is some unpublished data that I am sharing to show the data with Delta variant because of the comment that was made by, I believe it was Russell or possibly uh, the, the, the speaker between Russell and myself. And I think what is clear is that there is no great difference apart, uh, between alpha and delta. We're certainly not seeing worse illness with, uh, in terms of symptom duration or in terms of symptom prevalence. And I share this courtesy of my colleague, Carol Sutra. The clock study has just come online as a preprint. And this is a retrospective cohort study of PCR positive and age and negative matched for age, sex, and geography, children of about 7,000 children. Thank you, George. John from the Public Health England. They completed self-completed questionnaires three months after they'd been tested, looking at the time of their test and current symptoms, and a whole host of questionnaires related to physical and mental health, well-being, quality of life, and fatigue. The response rate was about one in eight, and at the time of testing, and I'd emphasize here that again, this was people had to have symptoms to be able to get tested at this point in time. Not surprisingly, those children who were positive were more likely to have symptoms at the time of testing. And I've put the results up there that people can look at later because I know this is a recording. They did not differ greatly according to positives and negatives. But the salient point to our conversation here is what were the results at three months? And the answer was the presence of physical symptoms was higher in both groups. And I'd emphasize that the children who were positive knew of their results. 66% of the positive, but 53% of the negative children were reporting symptoms at three months. Um, the children who were positive were more likely to have three or more symptoms. But again, you're seeing a lot of overlap. Um, in the symptoms between both kids who are negative and positive. And I think this really speaks to this question that the burden of the pandemic in children may not actually be physical illness in the sense of, of getting COVID. It's the fact of, of all of the other issues. There was no difference in mental health and wellbeing, um, and there was no real difference in fatigue. Uh, there were some differences in physical quality of life in mobility and pain and discomfort. And overall, 40% of the children who are positive and 39% of the children who are negative reported feeling worried, sad, and unhappy. And I think that speaks very much to the point of the previous speaker. I don't have time to go through all of this, but I would just highlight that for both the positive and the negative children, those who were assigned to class two, which were the multiple symptoms, tiredness, headache, shortness of breath, and dizziness, these were more likely to be female, Older, this is true, older um, young adults, 18, 19, more like, uh, I may not have got that quite right, it may have been 16, 17. They were more likely to have poorer health at baseline in their physical and mental health and at three months and to have more likely to have problems with mobility, self-care and unusual. And this was true whether you were positive or negative. Really speaking, and I quote the authors directly because I think they've summed it up perfectly, that pre-existing physical and mental health difficulties may influence symptoms down the line. I'll stop there, um, although I, I, I will share, happy to share the whole, the whole presentation um, and I'll try, go through so people can look at it more quietly in terms of other symptoms and background prevalence. And our conclusions really um, is that long duration of illness is uncommon in children, but it does occur in some. Um, and our data is very reassuring about the outcome. Most of the findings that we have really concord with what was found in the independently conducted thing. Um, and I'd emphasize that allocation of appropriate resources is going to be necessary for any child who's got a prolonged illness during the pandemic, whether it's due to SARS-CoV-2 
or due to anything else. And I hope very much that this helps to provide information discussion about the implication of the pandemic beyond just the implications of, um, of COVID-19 itself. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Emma, that was fun. A fascinating uh, presentation, especially uh, particularly on the Delta versus uh, previous variants, and also on the high rate of symptom reporting in people who have in children who haven't uh, got have been infected um, with SARS-CoV-2, which I guess won't come as a surprise to pediatricians. Uh, I'd uh, like to hand straight over to uh, Adam Finn, uh, who's here in sunny Bristol, uh, and is going to talk to us about the pros and cons of childhood vaccination. Can someone confirm they can see the slides and hear my voice? Yeah, I can see them. Okay, great. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Um, so I've been asked to uh, show you the balance with regard to childhood vaccination. I'm not really going to say much about the under 12s, uh, but uh, because we don't have much to say on that just yet. Um, my Twitter handle is Adam H. Finn. If you're a Twitter person, I only tweet about vaccines. Um, just a quick word on interest. So I'm a JCVI member. I'm also work, do work for the WHO. I'm the chief investigator on two of the UK programs of vaccine, COVID vaccines, Valneva and Sanofi, and also have been involved in several others. I do receive research funding. Well, my, my employer receives research funding from a number of vaccine companies, including Pfizer, Sanofi and GSK, uh, as well as various charitable sources. I don't own any stocks or shares in any companies or intellectual property. Uh, this graph from last year still applies uh, in the sense that unimmunized people um, are much more likely to die if they're older and children are very unlikely to die, as Russell showed quite uh, clearly at the beginning of the session. <clears throat> um, where we do see serious illness and deaths in children, it is for the most part in UK epidemiology in children with identifiable comorbidities. So the, the majority of those deaths and very, very small numbers actually of healthy children uh, ending up in hospital or dying, although they do occur. Um, when we look at hospitalizations with COVID, we do have to be careful about causation. Every child being admitted to hospital in any hospital in the UK at the moment will be having a test. Uh, and so children will test positive who are asymptomatic and being admitted for other reasons. That's really quite straightforward if they're coming in because they've had a broken leg. It's less straightforward if they're coming in with a febrile or respiratory illness to sort out causation. Um, so we're mostly talking about uh, mRNA vaccines because the only vaccines we've got authorized for the under 16s at the moment, uh, or under 18s in fact, are mRNA vaccines. They were developed extremely fast. The technology was ready um, and all they needed was the sequence of the spike to make the vaccines. They can also be reformulated quite quickly in principle, although there may be delays around choosing which variant to reformulate and getting uh, authorization and regulation approval. Uh, they're highly effective vaccines, mostly data from adults, uh, at least in the short term, there's beginning to be some evidence of waning, at least against mild disease. They're very reactogenic vaccines, so the majority of people get uh, short-term symptoms, particularly after the second dose. Um, it's a new technology, so things may turn up that we uh, are not expecting uh, uh, with the passage of time. They're relatively unstable vaccines, uh, so they're relatively difficult to store and handle, although that's not such a big problem as we originally feared, and they are, of course, expensive. <clears throat> um, I'll very quickly show you the main data we've got for uh, the adolescent population. There are two randomized controlled trials, both very similar. The first was Pfizer, published two or three months ago. Um, I won't go through all of these data because we're short of time, but broadly speaking, there was uh, the main take home finding of this randomized control study against placebo was that the reactogenicity was very similar to young adults, the immunogenicity was somewhat better, and all of the 16 cases that occurred in the study were in the placebo group. So that gives us relatively high confidence between 75 to 100. Uh, that the vaccines actually prevent symptomatic infection. Obviously, no serious cases occurring in this small study. Um, the uh, Moderna study was very similar, very slightly bigger, with a thousand more children in it, randomized two to one, uh, really quite high levels of reactogenicity, uh, 
Again, no serious adverse events, similar uh, immunogenicity to young adults. They only had four cases, and again, all in the placebo group, but not enough cases really to draw any conclusions because the numbers were small. Uh, we've got a partially recruited Oxford AstraZeneca study in children, which was um, we suspended the recruitment when the thrombosis problem uh, surfaced. And likewise, the Janssen adenoviral vector vaccine pediatric studies were suspended at that time. We are hoping to start a adolescent study with the Valneva, which is a whole virion inactivated vaccine shortly. There are various national immunization schedule evaluation consortium studies being uh, planned, including one in adolescence, uh, which we hope to start soon. And both Pfizer and Moderna are now doing studies in the under 12s. So in summary, uh, the pros, I guess, of immunizing children is that we can predict with reasonably high confidence that we can prevent cases of acute COVID, although these are in, uh, only in small numbers. Um, and most of them occur in children with comorbidities. So there's a logic to the current UK uh, strategy to identify and immunize children over 12 who've got comorbidities. We might be able to prevent some of the uh, prolonged symptoms that you've just heard about. We don't know for sure um, uh, to what extent that's possible, uh, but it's uh, possible to imagine that you could prevent that with vaccination to some extent at least. We might also be able to prevent the cases of the rare inflammatory syndrome that Russell mentioned. Again, we've got no evidence to support that, but it seems reasonable to infer that given it's a post-infectious syndrome, it might be preventable by vaccines. Um, and there might be some modest reduction in onward transmission. Uh, the indirect effect of these vaccines is not turning out to be as good as we had hoped and has slipped somewhat with the Delta variant. Uh, but there's no question that they do reduce the risks of infection and onward transmission to some extent. Uh, the cons, uh, well, principally reactogenicity. If we give all of the three to four million healthy 12 to 15 year olds the vaccine, a big proportion of them will have at least several days of not feeling very well as a result of receiving the vaccine, particularly if we give them two doses, because the second dose is more reactogenic. Um, uh, taking away the people who normally immunize children with other vaccines to do this may further disrupt those programs and ultimately result in more deaths from cervical cancer, meningitis and flu and so on. Uh, I think uh, Russell made the point that you can't do something without not doing something else. Uh, there may be uh, rare and unknown serious side effects and I'll mention one in just a moment before finishing. Um, and uh, of course, there is the global consideration that if you give vaccines to people who are at very low risk, you're not giving them to people who are at very high risk. And there are plenty of those around the world who've not been immunized. So myocarditis, we can't finish without mentioning this. There's a clear signal now for both mRNA vaccines, apparently higher for Moderna than Pfizer. Potentially that's related to the dose, which is 100 micrograms for Moderna, whereas only 30 from Pfizer. Uh, it's a condition that presents with chest pain, breathlessness, raised uh, palpitations, and, and raised cardiac enzymes. Um, in the North American data, it's predominantly after the second dose. That's less clear in the UK data. Um, but in both countries, it's clear, uh, and in Israel, there's a male predominance. Uh, as you get younger, it gets more common. So it seems to be a, a bigger problem in the young than in the old who have a smaller problem with COVID. It's an acute illness that is clinically self-limiting. They can be quite ill, but they generally recover and go home. Um, but there is this concern that the MRI changes show acute enhancement with a, a dye called gadolinium, which suggests that there might be longer term problems. This is a, a case series from the United States. The yellow arrows are showing abnormalities in the wall of the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of the heart. Uh, and these changes we need to follow up carefully over the next months to see whether they uh, uh, resolve or whether they turn into fibrosis, which could have long term implications for these children. What about the numbers? Well, the MHRA published data suggests very low numbers of cases indeed, around 10 uh, cases of either peri or myocarditis, which is cardiac inflammation per million doses. The more recent data that JCVI have seen suggests somewhat higher numbers and the, uh, a high level of uncertainty around both dose one and dose two estimates so that we could be seeing uh, 
at the worst case scenario, around 50 cases per million uh, children, given uh, a, a course of the vaccine. Um, and uh, set against that, you can see the numbers at the bottom of projected uh, um, pediatric admissions to ICU and hospital admissions. And essentially that comes out rather equally balanced, potentially some benefit over risk, but not massive. So uh, real uh, uncertainty there. Uh, so in summary, we've got two vaccines authorized for children from the age of 12 years. Um, there are a number of countries now uh, offering these vaccines to children. In the UK at the moment, we're taking a targeted approach, but that, that decision could change imminently because it's being further considered by the chief medical officers um, uh, as to whether there would be overall benefit in terms of education. There's a low disease burden in healthy children, and there's uncertainty about long-term implications of this novel myocarditis. So very, uh, uh, very, um, <laughs> very difficult balance to judge here and a lot of uncertainty. I'll stop there. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Adam. That was bang on time uh, and again, very, really clear. Uh, we, we're going to move on to the last uh, talk in this session, which is from Walter Stefansson Pors uh, from Iceland, where children from 12 to 15 uh, have been being vaccinated for some time, and he's going to tell us about the experience in Iceland. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation to take part in this webinar. Um, so I just wanted to give you a, a short overview of the pandemic in, in Iceland and how we've dealt with it, both in terms of um, control measures and then uh, vaccination. Um, so uh, we had the first cases in Iceland. You're, you're, not, you're, you're not showing your screen, Walter. Sorry. You can't see your slides. Yeah. That should be better, isn't it? That's great, thank you. All right, sorry about that. Yeah, so um, right from the outset, there was a strict test trace and isolate of, of all the cases uh, that... Uh, were diagnosed um, and all of the infected individuals were registered in a, in a centralized database and um, they were contacted through telephone calls every few days in the beginning and the children were included in, in that cohort. And um, as of last week, a total of, of uh, 1850 children had been diagnosed with COVID-19, which represents uh, just under two and a half percent of the pediatric population. And we've had no hospital admissions. Um, of that total cohort, we have about 30 children that needed medical assessment. Um, and a handful of them needed any medical treatment, uh, but no uh, admissions. We have had no confirmed case of the multi-system uh, uh, inflammatory syndrome. Although we've had five cases where uh, you could potentially make that diagnosis, but all of them had uh, negative serology for SARS-CoV-2 or, or PCR, and all of them recovered fully with the standard treatment. Um, and this is also to show you just the, the cumulative number of infected persons uh, per thousand inhabitants by age uh, group. And so there is a relatively low uh, cumulative in, in infection rates here in Iceland. Um, just one slide on the collateral damage of COVID and um, partly due to that strict test trace and isolate policy, um, the, the activity of, of children and, and adults were limited um, somewhat, um, especially uh, activity outside of classrooms, uh, social gatherings, sports, arts, and, and what have you. And so they'd ha this had a significant amount on, on uh, pediatric and adolescent uh, mental health. Many children experienced repeated episodes of isolations or even quarantine. Um, there was a, a significant increase in adolescent school dropouts. There was a large increase of attempted suicides in, in adolescents um, and also increased workload of, of the pediatric psychiatry units. So. Uh, so the, the discussion on, on, on vaccination started relatively early um, and uh, 
Professor Haraldsson and I, we sent a letter to the editor of the PRDJ in July this year, where, um, where we reported uh, results from two separate questionnaires that we had sent out to a number of Icelandic parents. And they were sent out actually in, in February, where the discussion on whether to vaccinate children against COVID wasn't really um, active. And, and these answers from um, just under uh, 5,800 parents and uh, in two separate cohorts, really, and found that um, 80 in, in one cohort and 91% were either very positive or positive towards vaccination for the children against COVID. Um, so that uh, sort of uh, led us to believe that people, the, the general public would be relatively receptive of uh, COVID vaccination for the children. Um, the Directorate of Health um, offered the vaccine to 16 and 18 year olds in, in April, May this year. Um, and then we had a relatively quiet uh, a few weeks in May and June. Um, restrictions uh, were uh, not in place anymore. And then we had the, the new wave of in infections in, in July. There were also in the news and in the, uh, uh, in the science community reports of more serious illnesses in, in children with the Delta variant. In Iceland, there were uh, suddenly a big surge in hospital admissions, both in um, infectious diseases units and intensive care units. At that time, there were no restrictions, uh, although that was to be changed, and travelers coming to the country were not screened. So um, at that point in time, so this is uh, early August, uh, there is widespread infection in the community, and there is uh, fear that that this would not be contained. Um, there is low cumulative infection rate, so uh, limited herd protection, um, especially in, in the youngest population. There is, on the other hand, a uh, high uptake of vaccination among uh, the older than 16 year olds and the total population around 80%. And then there were schools that were about to start uh, three weeks later. So the Directorate of Health decided to offer um, vaccination to 12 to 15 year olds in August. Um, and this was based on, on safety data, both, both from the US and the EU, and based on the, the, the current or the, the situation at that time. Um, so how did we do it? So um, there were no individual uh, um, offers for, for the vaccination. Um, it was uh, published on, on social media, um, in the news, um, and in the web pages of, for information for COVID, etc. That uh, children born in that year, in that month, were uh, to be offered the vaccine um, uh, at that point of time uh, during that day. And people just started queuing, and um, this is done in sports halls. Uh, you can see where uh, the child sits with one of the parents um, with one meter distancing to uh, the next group. They sit there for 15 minutes after being um, vaccinated and then uh, go back home. And this went really smoothly. Um, uh, so the, the, the um, sort of the way of doing it was not a, a problem. Um, and this is a, a, just a, a summary of, of the uh, vaccine doses given. And in the column to the left with the gray numbers, you can see the, the date of uh, the, the year of, of birth. And the 2006, seven and eight were the 12 to 15 year olds uh, that were offered the, the vaccine in, in August, uh, now about two weeks ago. And the, uh, the show up or the, the uptake was over 70% for all of these three uh, cohorts. Obviously, because this is so recent, the, the second dose has, not, has only been given to, uh, uh, to very few children. Um, we are actively also uh, collecting reports of, of uh, serious side effects. And so far, um, there have been 11 reported side effects from the 11,000 doses given as a, as a first dose, and none of them reported as serious. 
obviously small numbers compared to uh, larger countries. So just to summarize this, um, the, the opportunities in Iceland offer that we have a very close follow-up of all cases. So we actually believe that we know of everybody that has actually been infected. Can't be entirely true, um, but the majority of them are, are known. And, and um, that leads also to the fact that we most we know of, of all the ones that haven't been infected. We have no serious pediatric cases of COVID-19. Um, we have started the vaccination in 12 to 15 year olds, um, not without uh, discussion. And we uh, have really encouraged uh, parents to, to take that discussion with their child before uh, showing up for their vaccination stations. Um, and so far, we have not had any major complications, uh, but we will see how this develops further uh, over the next few weeks and months. Thank you. That's great, Walter. Thanks very much indeed. Um, so just remind people that the recording uh, will be up uh, after this uh, webinar is over. You'll, so there's lots of data that are being presented. I'm sure you, some of you will want to go through some of it at so, slower speed. Uh, and I'm going to hand over now to Alison, who's going to chair the next uh, session. Thanks very much, George, and welcome to the second session on childhood vaccination and overall immunity. And I'm going to hand straight over to Christine Benn, who's going to talk about the unknowns in relation to child COVID-19 vaccination. Thanks, Christine. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen now? Yes, if you could put it on to um, slideshow. Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today at this seminar. I'm a medical doctor who has worked for more than 28 years now in Africa studying the overall health effects of vaccines, and that has made me a co-developer of the concept of non-specific effects of vaccines. So I'm obviously quite biased in that regard, but apart from that, I don't have any conflicts of interest. I have looked at the data we have in relation to COVID-19 vaccination to, in children to inform the very current decision whether we should vaccinate children against sars coronavirus 2 or not. And in fact, this is part of a much bigger discussion. What is the end game for COVID-19? Should it become a vaccine disease for which we vaccinate everybody perhaps annually, or should it become a childhood disease like the other coronaviruses? We are, in other words, at a T-junction with regard to COVID-19, and the decision we make has implications perhaps many decades ahead. It's a challenge that we still have so little data, so people can look at the very same data and interpret them uh, very differently. Many countries are already vaccinating children, but though I'm very pleased that we do have vaccines and the possibility to vaccinate those at risk of severe COVID-19, including children at, uh, in risk groups, my interpretation of the available data, the currently available data, is that we are best served by not vaccinating healthy children, and we should rather turn COVID-19 into a childhood disease. I'm going to tell you more about why, and I'll start by mentioning the fact that I think there are at least six factors which need to take into, uh, into account at this uh, T-junction, and I'll go through them one by one, and then I'll try to grade the quality of the evidence we have for each of these factors and also define the unknowns. First, we of course have to address the issue, uh, the most important criterion normally when we introduce vaccines in the program, namely whether it's a disease of a certain severity. And other people have covered that very well already in the uh, presentation so far, but I'll just throw in some first data from Denmark showing that among those who had been confirmed uh, SARS coronavirus 2 positive um, in the uh, 0 to 19 year old uh, children in Denmark, uh, the healthy children, there were only 0.2% who were hospitalized. And we've had two deaths so far, both in children with comorbidities uh, yielding a very low mortality. Emma Duncan very well presented the data and I think the best study we have so far that she has done on the risk of long COVID and it was quite reassuring uh, with regards to both the duration and the outcomes. Uh, but of course, there are still some unknowns in relation to uh, long COVID. But um, generally speaking, in Denmark, if we look at COVID-19, it would not fulfill the criterion to make it into a vaccine disease just due to the uh, low uh, severe or the, 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 the um, 
uh, infection severity. Um, and I've put it therefore here on the right hand side with the childhood diseases uh, and uh, in the brackets try to, to put as I see it, the quality of the evidence for uh, the data we have on severity, which I think is quite high, but uh, still quite low in spite of, of Emma Duncan's nice study uh, with regards to long COVID. So there, obviously, there are still some unknowns to be covered. I'll jump on to the um, adverse events after vaccination, and there we also have quite limited data. And here are the results from the Pfizer uh, phase three trial in, in the only 2000 and some. 12 to 15 year old children, numbers are quite small, but if the data is valid, this was translated into maybe a low risk of adverse events uh, in, in the greater gain, but still quite considerably that if we among, uh, if we vaccinate 100,000 children, we would anticipate to see 450 children who would have a severe adverse event and 260 children would experience a serious adverse event. So, so that after all yields up to something. These are events that they would not otherwise have had. We know there is an increased risk of myocarditis that, that Adam uh, um, also mentioned. It's a rare event, but of course the benefits of vaccinations have to be weighed against potential harms. And a new preprint today does exactly that and uh, try to compare the risk of post-vaccination myocarditis in boys here in the orange lines uh, with the risk of getting hospitalized with COVID over the following six months. And even uh, under the uh, circumstance where we have high infectious disease pressure uh, here in dark blue, it seems clear uh, from this analysis at least that the risk of myocarditis exceeds uh, the risk of hospitalizations for healthy children. So, so far, there doesn't seem to be very frequent serious or severe or serious adverse events in the first months. But there are many uh, uncertainties. Data is limited and the disease is so mild that uh, even few known adverse events and possibly unknown adverse events weigh heavily in the decision against weigh, uh, vaccinating healthy children. Third, and that is really my area of expertise, is the nonspecific effects of vaccines. These effects are increasingly acknowledged and they signify that a vaccine can affect the risk of other infections, sometimes positively and sometimes negatively. And the pattern observed is that live vaccines increase the resistance towards other infections, whereas non-live vaccines, in spite of protecting against the vaccines, uh, vaccine diseases paradoxically have been uh, seen to increase the susceptibility to other infections and particularly in females. I'll show you the example here of BCG vaccine. Um, uh, it's a vaccine against tuberculosis and it should not prevent other diseases. But in fact, what we saw in three trials was that it reduced neonatal mortality by more than a third. And this was due to nonspecific protection against other diseases, namely septicemia and respiratory infections. So this might seem quite outrageous that a vaccine against tuberculosis can uh, protect against such diseases. But in fact, we now have an immunological mechanism in the form of trained innate immunity. Um, that uh, BCG uh, apparently, as well as other live vaccines, can uh, change or epigenetically modify the innate immune cells so that they become more responsive towards not only the disease, uh, the vaccine pathogen, but also against other pathogens. And that can help explain why these vaccines could prevent other uh, infections. But Worryingly, we have an opposite pattern observed from the non-live vaccines, and here's the example of DTP vaccine, uh, a slide summarizing all the uh, studies that have been done comparing DTP vaccinated girls with uh, unvaccinated, DTP unvaccinated girls, and yielding a meta estimate of a 2.5 fold higher all-cause mortality in female, females after DTP vaccination, which was due, due to increased susceptibility to other infections. And also here we have some data now coming out on the potential immunological mechanisms, which seem to be opposite to what we saw for live vaccines, because in a randomized trial of 75 females, we saw that DTP induced innate tolerance and made, uh, resulted in long-term repression of monocyte-derived cytokine responses, which could help explain why this vaccine could increase the susceptibility to other infections in, in, um, in females. Unfortunately, the current system for testing vaccines is not updated to capture nonspecific effects of vaccines, because you all know that, that uh, for instance, a pneumococcal infection, which occurred three months post vaccination, or, or an absence of a pneumococcal infection that would otherwise have occurred, would never in the current system be registered as a potential side effect of any other vaccine than a pneumococcal vaccine, though for all we know, it might very well be uh, a side effect. 
So we don't know if the new vaccines will have non-specific effects and we don't know in which direction they are. The only, um, we, we know they are new vaccines and we, aren't, we can't easily classify them as live vaccines or non-live vaccines. But the only tiny piece of evidence we have come from a preprint which shows that the Pfizer vaccine behaves, unfortunately, it seems like the non-live vaccines, it increases the innate tolerance towards bacterial and viral ligands, and that could suggest that the vaccines may increase uh, in the long run the risk of other unrelated infections. But I would say that data is so sparse that so far I can't really put this uh, factor on either side of, of the crossroad or in the T junction. If the vaccines turn out to have beneficial non specific effects, this could be an argument for vaccinating children against COVID 19. But of course, uh, it would be the opposite case if it turns out to have negative non specific effects. And this is absolutely something I think which is a large unknown and something we should do much more to study in the future. Regarding what uh, gives the best protection against reinfection, other people already also touched upon that, but it seems quite clear now that just like we know from most other infectious diseases, immunity after natural infection is stronger and more long lasting than induced immunity. We're one and a half year into the pandemic and there are very few confirmed reinfections, but many reports of breakthrough infections. So this is really a strong argument in my point of view for uh, allowing COVID-19 to become a, a childhood disease. Regarding uh, transmission and mutations, uh, the risk of mutation, it is acknowledged that children transmit less than adults, also showed nicely by Dr. Weiner, I think. Uh, but in the short term, there seems to be little doubt that vaccination would reduce the risk of transmission and also thereby potentially the risk of mutations. But on the other hand, it follows from the fact that natural immunity is stronger and broader, that in the long run, the best way to reduce transmission and mutations might be that many more people had natural immunity. So to sum up the evidence presented here, <clears throat> I'm a great believer in vaccines and I ascribe the major global decline in child mortality over the last decades uh, to vaccines. But for now, based on the sparse data and the many unknowns, I reached the conclusion that we should not vaccinate healthy children against COVID-19. First and foremost, before we recommend vaccination of children who have very little, if anything, to gain from specific disease protection, we really need to be sure that the harms do not exceed uh, the benefits. As you'll note, I graded a lot of the evidence uh, of low quality or very low quality. And the real challenge here, as I mentioned in the beginning, is that other people have looked at exactly the same data and reached the conclusion that we need to vaccinate healthy children. So I hope we'll have time to discuss which kind of data is needed to fill the gaps where there's currently too much room for subjective interpretation so that we all can become more certain about the best way forward. Mm -hmm. I personally would change my mind regarding vaccination of healthy children if we found that there were serious long-term negative effects of COVID-19 in children, or if new variants emerged with more severe disease in children, or for that matter, adults making the need to reduce transmission more pertinent, and obviously also if the new vaccines turn out to have beneficial non-specific effects. So with that, thank you very much for the invitation to present here. Thanks, Christine. That was a very clear exposition. I'm going to move straight on now to Chadi Sadroy and Caroline Wagner. We're going to talk about modelling vaccination and the whole issue of variance and equity. Thanks, Chadi. Um, you see the slides okay? Great. Yes, Caroline, thanks. Okay. Chadi, are you there? Yeah. Okay, so, thanks for the introduction. So Chadi and I are gonna talk about some work that we've done with our team um, on modeling of vaccine deployment and burden in the medium term. Um, so we've, we've heard today a lot of discussion from pediatricians and doctors about uh, effects and, and infection risk and whatnot in children. And so and we've also heard discussion more broadly about uh, potential uh, trade-offs regarding vaccine rollout um, from, for different risk groups in some countries. So for instance, what are the benefits of vaccinating lower risk groups in one country versus higher risk groups uh, more broadly around the world? 
So this is a bit of a change of pace from what we've largely been hearing, but our, our work sort of thinks about that without thinking about risk groups specifically, but sort of just exploring um, epidemiological and evolutionary trade-offs depending on how we ac uh, allocate vaccines broadly between countries. So in other words, if countries largely retain vaccines and much of the world goes unvaccinated, which is uh, sort of the position we're in now uh, versus if vaccines are more equitably distributed. So this, so what we're going to present today is sort of a, a minimal conceptual modeling framework we've been developing uh, over the last year or so to think about the interaction between disease control, immunology, and epidemiology, and how these all interact. Uh, and what we used it for initially was to think about how variations in immune responses to natural and vaccinal and uh, natural infection and and a potential vaccine would affect the timing and burden of COVID nineteen cases. And subsequently, we looked at how dose spacing might influence um, epidemiological and evolutionary considerations. So going through this framework uh, very quickly then, uh, it's sort of predicated on the fact that natural immunity might not be lifelong uh, to many infections. It, in fact, often isn't, um, but also individuals might not be equally susceptible after having been infected a first time. So this is what's known as an SIR, which means susceptible, infected, recovered, and then in brackets, we put susceptible again, meaning that after you receive, after you're infected a first time, you may return as a result of waning immunity to partial susceptibility, but this susceptibility might be qualitatively different from uh, full susceptibility for a naive individual. And so what we did was vary sort of the strength of these, this immunity and, and project out how that changed uh, case numbers in the medium term. And we saw that it was very sensitive to, to how robust immune responses are as might be expected. We have then updated this with vaccination and once again saw similar effects where, of course, increasing immunity through vaccination was better for suppressing burden, but again, the strength of immune responses was very important. So obviously the unknowns dominate. And then another big unknown when we were first doing this work initially, we didn't really know what the characteristics of the vaccines would look like. And then eventually it became pretty clear that it was two dose vaccines. And there's a number of questions that emerged regarding the timing and the gap spacing between them and what are the potential epidemiological or evolutionary outcomes. So we extended our previous model, which you can see from the different color types, there's only a few and now there are many more to include two doses of a vaccine, which is V1 and V2. And so obviously the complexity is higher now and you can see from this left panel, all the different infection and immune types that are possible in the population now in our extended model. But this model now allows us to examine what the potential outcomes are. And so we can couple this to a simple phylodynamic evolutionary model seen in this middle panel uh, based on Grenfell et al. 2004 in science. And basically here, the model is very simple. There's just a potential net viral adaptation rate and it's based on within host, within one host. And that's a function of the immune pressure. And it depends on the viral abundance and the strength of selection. So you see this black parabola and basically each infection type lies somewhere along this curve and we don't really know where. So with our model, we can investigate all the different possibilities. And so we looked at a variety of scenarios. And then with the combination of these things, now we're able to project the medium term, what happens in the medium term for the infection types, the immune types and viral adaptation, which you can see here. So these are the top plot is an area plot where it shows the fraction of the population according to each different infection type. And then the bottom is the relative net adaptation rate of relative net rate of adaptation that you might expect depending upon which evolutionary scenario you're in. So basically we can just try and look at different scenarios and then we can extend this to two regions. And so this is what we covered in this latest work. So now we're thinking about two countries, potentially the same or different population sizes. And we first examine the case where they're decoupled. And so they're only coupled, the epidemiological dynamics are decoupled. So they're only coupled through this vaccine allocation, which you see here parameter F. So basically the vaccine, there's the high access region, which has access to a lot of vaccine and they might want to share some vaccine with the low access region. And it's possible to do that. And then we can just examine the potential outcomes in our slightly refined model. And then we go on and we couple this with adding immigration and as well as evolutionary potential with uh, an increase in transmission rate. So if we just look at the decoupled model first, we can basically examine the long-term equilibrium so we can do this mathematically and then we can look at different scenarios. And so here's just one, just select a few illustrative diagrams just to show what, you know, what the different, how you're able to tune these parameters. And so here we're looking at situations, the columns are different types of immunity, 
and the rows are different transmissions. And so the top row is symmetric. So there's equal transmission in both regions. The lower second row is less transmission in the high access region and the lower one is less transmission in the low access region. And so lo and behold, when you share vaccines and the x-axis is a fraction of vaccines allocated from the high access region to the low access region, the average infections at equilibrium is shown on this uh, y-axis. So lo and behold, increasing the fraction of vaccines shared minimizes or decreases the number of infections in both regions and the sum of them. And obviously, as you increase the asymmetries in transmission, then a number of complexities may arise. But I just want to point a few things out. So we can look at the specific, so that's obviously the average infections at equilibrium, but we can look at the specific values in each country at, for a low vac global vaccination rate and then for a high global vaccination rate. So here's a low global vaccination rate. And you can see that, and it's again, it's asymmetric transmission. So again, we're emphasizing that increasing non-pharmaceutical interventions in the high access region might actually be beneficial for both countries. And so in a low global vaccination rate, you do see that every time tr you're trading off basically by allocating vaccines to the low access region, the high access region increases infections. And so there's this trade-off that's gonna depend upon the relative transmission in each country. But if the global vaccination rate rises, then all of a sudden you can see it's very beneficial to allocate a large fraction of the vaccines to the low access region, especially if the transmission is reduced in the high access region. So this just illustrates that you're able to tune these parameters. And then we can go and look at the medium term projections, which again, depending, there's a number of situations here. So we're just picking one here as an illustrative case. And we're looking at a one dose policy versus a switch to two dose strategy. And then you can see again, without going into too many of the details, but you can look at the each little panel has an area plot for the high access region, low access region, number of cases and severe cases on the top. And again, here you can see that sharing largely decreases cases in the low access region, even in the case of a one dose policy. And even in that case, even if one dose is poor, which is what we're showing here, then you still end up reducing severe cases in the longer run. And so that the, there's a clinical benefit to doing so. And obviously if you switch to two-dose strategy, then that mitigates any potential negative outcomes. So just to illustrate, and we have this shiny interaction, shiny online interaction application that people can use if they're interested in playing around with these parameters and testing different, uh, different scenarios for themselves. So I would encourage any interested uh, viewer to visit this application and just get familiar with the different possible possible parameters. And so obviously now the next big question is what happens when you couple the models together? So I'll just go through this quickly. You don't have that much time left, but this is now the, the world where the two regions are coupled. So we allow cases uh, to move back and forth between them. And also we assume that if this potential for evolution gets high enough, then uh, the transmission rate could increase in both countries, which we use as sort of a proxy for some sort of emergence of a new variant, which may be more transmissible. And so for given evolutionary assumptions, then what we can do is plot out um, it, for a range of parameters, the expected number of cases and these increases in transmission, both in high access region, low access region, and in both combined. And we do so on the x-axis for the, uh, the fraction of vaccines retained by the high access region. And then on the y-axis, we vary either the immigration rate or the reproduction number ratio. So this accounts for one region having a different overall transmission rate than the other. Again, highlighting the importance of NPIs and any regional differences in transmission rates. So what I think this framework allows us to do is point out some interesting differences between what the two coupled and decoupled frameworks would predict. So what I'll do is draw your attention to one specific case, which would be, for instance, if the high access region retained all vaccines, and the low access region had a slightly higher overall transmission rate. And then when we plot either the coupled or the decoupled models, what we see is that if the high access region assumes it lives in the decoupled world, it thinks it's gonna have a better, better outcome by retaining this large fraction of vaccines because of the low predicted incidence of transmission increases and uh, cases. But once you allow for coupling, this benefit goes away to a large extent. And that's because of case importation and the fact that letting infections um, persist in low access regions allows for transmission increases, which are sort of simulate variant emergence, which undermines uh, vaccine efficacy everywhere. <clears throat> so we can do this for different immune assumptions as well. So obviously the results are, are not straightforward and there is a lot of complexity, but it helps to start us uh, to help get a grasp for, for what these parameters mean. <clears throat> 
I'm gonna have to ask you to finish yeah. up. Oh yeah, so we're wrapping up. So yeah, just so put our conclusions up on the slide. Yeah. Them, um, Basically, but, you know, vaccine, we want to share equitable vaccine, make sure that vaccines are shared and we have equitable distributions and it's gonna be beneficial on the epidemiological and evolutionary uh, scale, so. Great. Thanks. Thank you. That was very, that was very clear indeed. Thanks very much. Um, vaccine sharing answer to the first question. Um, Rasta Mantia now uh, on transition to endemicity and role of infection in childhood. Thanks, Rasta. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'll be talking about the transition from epidemic to endemic dynamics and briefly touch upon implications for childhood vaccinations. So an outline is going to be, I'll first talk about infection and immunity to the four endemic human coronaviruses, which are circulating and to which we don't pay too much attention. Maybe we should have paid some more attention to them in the past. Then I'll sort of use that framework to understand the transition of a novel emerging coronavirus such as SARS-CoV-2, or just CoV-2 for short, from epidemic to endemic. And finally, I'll end with looking at what we need to measure. Okay. So, this slide looks at immunity to endemic human coronaviruses. What do we see? If we look at the age prevalence of antibodies to typical endemic human coronaviruses, and here I've just shown one alpha and one beta coronavirus. In purple, you see the IgM antibodies, which are a sign of primary infections, and IgG antibodies, which are a sign of primary or secondary infections. You see in for both alpha and beta coronaviruses, the mean age of first infection is extremely low. It's under four years as measured by IgM. And if we looked at it, it probably would be a little better. If we looked at it by IgG, it would be even lower than that. So that says primary infections occur in early childhood. They cause colds. There's also high circulation of the endemic human coronaviruses and we get infected with them every few years, as sh is shown in this very nice study, which looked at se how serum antibodies change with time over a period of a couple of decades. So you see that immunity here to HCOB and L63 wanes, and then every now and then you get infected with it, which is a spike or a boost. And you see the same for all the different coronaviruses, but you don't see that, for example, for antibodies to measles. So this tells us that secondary infections and reinfections are frequent throughout life and that they give rise to very mild symptoms. So what we are going to ask is what would happen if primary infections happened in adults, as happens when a new coronavirus emerges. And really there's some very interesting ideas that this might have happened earlier on in history about a hundred years ago when OC43 emerged and actually caused potentially quite a severe pandemic. Okay. What we need to do is take into account the idea that immunity to coronaviruses wanes. So, Immunity is not all or nothing. When one gets infected either with a primary infection or reinfection, you boost immunity to high levels. That can temporarily provide protection from getting infected, which is called sterilizing immunity and transmitting. But as immunity wanes, you don't have enough immunity to prevent getting infected or transmitting, but you have enough immunity to prevent getting ill when you do get infected. So if we use this simple model, we can look at how an emerging coronavirus would transition from an epidemic state to an endemic state. So on this plot, the black line and the left axis shows the number of cases, sort of taking just ballpark estimates in a toy model for an a population the size of the US, 
And on the colors show the age at which people get primary infections. So during the initial few years, you get a large epidemic, particularly if you don't have any interventions and even non-pharmaceutical interventions. And you get this enormous initial epidemic, which then subsides and within the period of a decade or so, gives rise to a much milder endemic stage. During the epidemic phase, there's a huge number of infections. During the epidemic phase, there are fewer infections and these are distributed over time. Critically, during the epidemic phase, which you can see over here, infections are distributed in all age groups. Primary, infe sorry, primary infections are distributed in all age groups. And primary infections are particularly important because those typically are the ones that are most severe. During the endemic phase, primary infections are restricted largely to children. So the severity of what happens depends really on whether primary infections are happening in children who have relatively mild symptoms or whether primary infections are ha happening in adults and that gives rise to more severe infections. So for COVID-2, you see that infections are relatively mild in childhood, but infection severity increases with age. And in this case, you can see that early on when infections happen in all ages, they're likely to be more severe, but during the endemic phase when primary infections are happening almost exclusively in young children, you're going to have a milder disease outcome. So really the conclusion is over here, that the disease severity as we approach the endemic depends primarily on the severity of primary infections in children. And you can see that for both COVID-1 and COVID-2, we have the relatively benign case of where disease severity is mild in children. So children will get generate immunity, which protects them from disease or potentially protects them from disease in adulthood. And really this assumes that the infections are relatively mild. So over here for both COVID-2 and COVID-1, the average infection fatality ratio will decline with time and the rate of decline depends on how fast the disease goes through the population. This isn't really guaranteed for all coronaviruses because if we look, for example, for how the infection fatality rate changes with age for the MERS coronavirus, we see that it's actually quite severe in children. And if it's severe in children, then the infection fatality rate won't decrease over time. And during the endemic state, it won't be a mild disease. Okay, so what we've got over here is a scenario that might well be the case. We don't know it, and there are several things we need to measure. The most important assumption in the model is that primary infections are mild in children. So we really need to focus on disease severity, particularly of primary infections in young children. And really by young children, it depends on what the mean age of primary infection is. For the endemic circulating human coronaviruses, that's under four years of age. Childhood vaccination will be particularly important if the virus evolves and the new variants cause more severe disease in children. And fortunately, that doesn't seem to be happening, but there's no guarantee that that is the case for all coronaviruses, for, because for example, MERS does have a high infection fatality rate in young children. Finally, we note that this might change a little when mothers are immune, because this transfer of maternal antibodies, which confers some protection to the infant. The other aspect we need to measure is how vaccine efficacy and immune efficacy 
change after vaccination and natural infection. So we need to really separate the magnitude and duration of protection, which prevents infection, reduces transmission, and most importantly, prevents pathology. We need to know how it differs between vaccination and natural infection. We need to know whether vaccinating older people gives rise to equivalent protection as vaccinating younger people. And finally, we know to, need to know whether natural infection versus vaccination have the same breadth of response protection against new virus variants. And finally, I'd like to sort of end by saying the endemic, during the endemic state, the focus really should, might change from disease to uh, from looking at um, to focusing on disease rather than the prevalence of infection. So I'll stop here by acknowledging the people who did the work. And this was all done in collaboration with Jenny Levine here at Emory and Otto Bjornstad at Penn State. And we thank the NIH for funding. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Rustin, and thank all three speakers for very clear presentations. Really marvelous. Um, handing over now to Cameron Abassi for the third and final session before we go on to the panel. Great, Alison, thank you very much. It's been a fascinating uh, webinar so far, and I'm sure the third session is going to be no different. I'm Cameron Abbas, the Executive Editor for Content at the BMJ, and this session is about equity, sustainability, and ethics in relation to childhood vaccination. We've got two excellent speakers, the first of which is Sridhar Venkatapuram from King's College London, and Sridhar's uh, topic is global equity and childhood vaccination. What are the issues? Sridhar. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you very much for sticking around for so long. It's such an excellent uh, uh, sort of webinar. And, and I hope that um, you stay around after my talk as well. Um, so I've been asked to speak about the global equity implications of childhood vaccinations. Um, and so I'm going to do it in three parts. The fantastic thing is that uh, in this webinar, we're not expected to give you a definite, definitive answer or one solution to the problem. So what I want to do is lay out uh, three parts to this um, so that we have a better understanding of the different kinds of ethics and equity issues. Um, the first is that uh, I'm really grateful to be included in this kind of webinar because I think that a lot of different people have uh, an uncomfortable relationship with the idea of ethical reasoning and, and the fact that somehow uh, data and evidence will tell us what to do and what the right thing to do is. But as we can see from all the different excellent presentations that there's a variety of different data and the ability to assess the data and to be able to put it into some sort of context is partly what ethics and ethical reasoning is about. So the concern here is about what is the global implications, particularly on global equity in relation to the pandemic and the choice about to vaccinating our children or not? The background problem essentially is that there are a limited number of vaccines uh, in the world, and most of those vaccines are uh, held in rich countries uh, through a variety of different kinds of purchase agreements or orders. Um, so, sorry, excuse me. Are you able to turn on your video? And if you're sharing a slide. Oh, sorry, it, I'm yeah. really sorry. I was so <laughs> excited about see. giving this talk that I didn't even actually turn <laughs> yeah. on my camera. You're so even better in real life. Yeah, sorry okay. about that. Uh, my apologies, uh, just too excited about it. Um, so the, and I, and I do not have uh, slides. I just have uh, my talk. Marvelous, yeah. That's great. So the, the global problem, as I was saying, is that we have a limited number of vaccines in the world at present, and, uh, and then they are being currently manufactured, more are being manufactured, but there are a finite amount. Most of them uh, belong uh, in or belong to rich country owners and governments, uh, mostly. So the problem is, is that so far, according to The Economist, our excess deaths related to COVID are approximately 18 or so million people have died over the last two years uh, in, in consequence to um, sort of COVID and related issues. And many of these deaths would be preventable have, uh, you know, had they had vaccines. And the idea is to prevent future deaths as well. 
So um, there is very much a, a problem here about how do we distribute vaccines that are being held in one place and get it to the people that need it in another place. And so one of the really important roles here and one of the organizations in this kind of problem has been the World Health Organization. And I'm pointing it out particularly in terms of ethics because the perspective that the WHO is taking and has to take is one where they think about uh, the human population as uh, one group of people and thinking about the pandemic across the human species rather than within countries. And the argument that they have made is that you know vaccines should go to where they are needed the most. Uh, and at present, their argument is that it should go to people who are vulnerable and also to healthcare workers for a variety of reasons, particularly to prevent deaths of the vulnerable, but also prevent deaths of healthcare workers, but also help them maintain the healthcare system. They've also taken a position regarding children, which is that given the existing evidence that uh, children are have milder cases of disease if they become infected, that they are less uh, urgent in priority to be vaccinated than older and other high-risk individuals within the population and healthcare workers within the population. But the other point that they're making is that they should also um, other people in other countries who are vulnerable and healthcare workers in other countries should be prioritized over vaccinating children in one's own country. While this makes sense from a WHO perspective, this idea that children in one country should be prioritized less than adults and healthcare workers and people more at risk in other countries might make sense to them, it does um, pose a different kind of problem within a country, um, such as in the UK, where the JCVI was considering whether or not to uh, sort of advise on vaccines. What they decided, and it's worth pointing out, is that they looked at the risk and benefits to children, but more importantly, they clearly state that they only look at the health risks and benefits. Um, and they state that they do not look at the wider social implications of vaccinating children. And a lot of the speakers today have been speaking about all the other different kinds of uh, you know, risks and benefits, not only to the children themselves, but, are, but to the wider community. It is here that I think that the ethical reasoning needs to take place, which is that the JCVI is saying that we don't take a position on the wider social implications of this. And therefore, it's leaving it up to the government to have other committees or other groups of people decide on whether or not to vaccinate children for the sake of wider social benefits. So far, many of the people that we've talked about, that we've heard from today, have been speaking about the health benefits to the individuals, but also on the epidemiological evolution based on vaccinations. So I think it's here that we uh, really need to focus on in terms of ethics is this idea that uh, whether vaccinating children will not only what the risks and benefits are in terms of health benefits to the individuals, but also to the wider social um, sort of implications. Here, the question about wider social implications, even for the JCVI, has always been in terms of the UK population. What we have been asked to do is to think about the global implications of this. The idea is that if we um, have vaccines that we do not use to vaccinate children, then those vaccines could go towards vaccinating other people in other countries, namely most at risk or healthcare workers as well. And one could make that argument if you were to believe that uh, you know, all people in the world have equal value and then we should think about in a pandemic, think about the interdependencies of the future evolution of pandemics and the implications and that we're all connected. Many people do not think that way, particularly politicians would have first sort of have a sense that they should think about their own country first, but there might be epidemiologists or people working at the WHO who think about it in a, in a global sense. The second thing is that if we were to say, well, yes, we should not vaccinate children because there are people in other places in the world that need it more, the question is, would they actually get there? And one of the problems here is that the vaccination procurement 
and purchase and et cetera has been evolved in such a way that that simply is not the logical extension of it. A substantial number of steps would have to happen such that we could make a decision that children should not get vaccinated and those vaccines should go to other countries. And this, as many people have pointed out, is because of the way that uh, most of the vaccines have been purchased through uh, private, uh, private entities and also through private purchase and commercial um, sort of agreements. The other point that I do want to make, and this is important to make, is that in the UK at the moment, um, we have approximately 200 million excess doses of vaccines. This is according to, um, this is supposed to reflect not only vaccinating all 16 year olds and above, uh, and also um, you know, giving the booster shots, if we were going to give them, we would still have 200 million excess doses. And so those doses are sitting somewhere. Um, and this does not count the approximately 400 or more million doses that are still on order of other kinds of vaccines that are all also going to come in. So the UK is sitting on a huge number of excess doses that could be going towards other places in, in the world as well. There's also right now uh, millions of doses that are going to wastage. So for example, in the United States, approximately 15 million doses have been wasted since March. Um, so there's lots of uh, excess doses, lots of wasted doses that are going on. I just want to also say that when we were thinking about a trade-off between global versus the children, it's not as simple as we think it is, but also, also opening up the space for us to recognize that the JCVI did not think about the wider social benefits, whether within the UK or globally. And that is really what I think one of the central ethical questions here is about thinking about the role of vaccinating children and the wider social implications. Thank you. Sujal, thank you very much. Uh, very important issues and very clearly explained and argued. Um, I'm sure there may well be questions about this uh, in the follow-up. Thank you. We'll come back to you. Um, our next speaker is Peter Doshi. Peter's a colleague of ours at the BMJ. He's also a professor of pharmacy at the University of Maryland. Peter's going to talk about transparency of vaccination data. Peter. Great, hopefully you can hear me, see me, slides, yep. everything. Everything, Peter. Peter, yeah. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna uh, focus my talk on another aspect of the ethics here in the conversation, which is access to data. But before I get into that, I just wanted to share a brief observation I had, which is that I actually find it quite remarkable, uh, particularly in light of the many remaining un uncertainties that we've been discussing today, that uh, societies are even contemplating COVID vaccines in children already, as it basically took about four decades to get to this point for influenza vaccines. Uh, influenza vaccines were, were introduced in 1960 for those 65 plus, because that's where the majority of deaths occurred. Uh, just like with COVID. And over time, the target populations expanded um, until eventually everybody six months and up was considered at risk. But it took four decades to normalize the notion of influenza vaccines for all. Yet with COVID, we're witnessing the serious consideration of vaccines in children just months after the adult vaccination campaign began. So on transparency, when I think about clinical trial, uh, data transparency. This is my go-to visual. The iceberg uh, here helps uh, express the idea that clinical trials produce uh, copious amounts of data, but often the vast majority of those data remain below the waterline and so are inaccessible to most people. Instead, uh, what we only get is access to the visible part of the iceberg, just that tip there, which holds things like journal publications. The danger is that sometimes what appears in journal articles is not the whole story. Uh, journal publications might underreport or misreport what actually occurred. Uh, the key is that you can only really know whether the article in your hands is trustworthy is when you have data transparency, that is access to the documents and data beneath the waterline, like clinical study reports, case report forms, and other patient level data. It's only then that you can develop a robust nu nuanced understanding of what happened in the trial. So let me just offer two uh, quick examples of the pitfalls of uh, publications and importance of access to data. This is Pfizer's pivotal uh, phase three trial that was published in the New England Journal last December. And see if you can spot the difference between the original 
and revised document. Originally, the research summary and abstract uh, presented a post hoc endpoint without declaring it as post hoc and then mixed the presentation of outcome data from two different time periods. After we pointed this out to the journal, they deleted the table. It's nice that things were uh, promptly corrected, but it's also only because we had access to the trial protocol that we were able to detect the deficiencies in reporting in the first place. Here's a second example from that same trial. So everybody knows that uh, the, the Pfizer's trial was a randomized double blind study, as it says here, right? That's what it, we can see on the screen. But unblinded staff were used in this so-called double blinded trial, specifically those receiving, dispensing, preparing, and administering, critically administering the study interventions. These people were unblinded and knew what they were handling. And we know this again, thanks to access to the study protocol. So I chose those examples uh, because they're quick, easy to understand, I think, in a short presentation. Uh, but hopefully they illustrate the pitfalls of relying on just journal publications, even peer reviewed ones, for critically appraising trials and subsequent decision making. I think they point to the fundamental need for access to underlying data, which I hope is not seen as a controversial point, because it's certainly not a new point. It's one that academics have been highlighting for a long time. So here's Ian Chalmers in 1990 and an early call for data transparency from the BMJ. And then again in 2009 at the beginning of the Tamiflu saga. And in the wake of Tamiflu, over the last decade, uh, industry in particular became quite vocal about uh, their commitment to data sharing. Uh, but during COVID, besides this, what I would characterize as a momentary outcry over in a, inadequate transparency of clinical uh, trial protocols, which happened last summer, there seems to me to be uh, little concern amongst industry, academia, or government about the state of transparency of trial data for COVID vaccines. So in a recent uh, paper, we cataloged the availability of data and documents for a number of the leading vaccines. And I basically summarized the state of data transparency as very poor. It could be worse, uh, but it's not good. You know, one has to keep in mind in all of this that this is not business as usual. COVID vaccines are already being used by hundreds of millions of people, yet we still do not have full access to data. There's mixed availability of protocols, really depends on which trial you're talking about. Uh, and there's almost no clinical study reports available. You'll see in the final column of this table that for Pfizer and Moderna, there's over 3000 pages available which is all thanks to the transparency policies of Health Canada and the European Medicines Agency. But there's an important caveat, uh, which is that the release documents, for example, this clinical study report, they contain copious redactions said to protect the trial blinding, which is a bit of an interesting or perplexing reason uh, considering that the trial is almost entirely unblinded. Uh, yet these documents can still help answer some questions. That is true. Uh, but obviously, the utility of documents like this is severely compromised until the redactions are lifted, which may be months or years from now. And when it comes to trials in children, there's even less, uh, first and foremost, because most trials are still underway. But for those uh, trials which have reported some results, we have no clinical study reports, uh, no sample informed consent forms have been released. This is a pediatric trial that's been published, um, but you can see that underlying data is not available. That's the no, uh, the first row of the table. Uh, this Moderna trial, it's not even clear when the investigators intend to share data. It seems if they do, if they will share the data, it's only after the study completes and study completion won't occur for another year. And that's a common theme. The manufacturers are all tying uh, their data sharing dates to trial completion, and most trials won't complete for many more months. So data for Pfizer, try in April, 2025. Moderna, October, 2022. AstraZeneca, perhaps this December. 
A year ago, uh, David Healy and I called on doctors and professional societies to publicly state that without complete data transparency, they should refuse to endorse COVID products as being based on science. We said this well in advance of any vaccine trials reporting results, but I think it's time to reiterate that call. To get people on board with science, we need to practice science. And I think that there are many people like me who believe that data transparency is fundamental to science. How can you have real informed consent without access to data? Access to data will enable all of us to have more confidence in our interpretations of the data and the decisions we make. I think we should refuse to endorse our products as based on science unless we have complete data transparency, especially when it comes to our children. Thanks very much. Peter, thank you very much. That was short and sweet. Caught me on the hop. Well done, thank you. Uh, okay, we're gonna go straight to Phil now for, for the question session. Phil Hammond. Gosh, so many questions there. Uh, Peter, if you're still there at the moment, can you, is Peter still there? I am, yep. That rather blew my mind what you said just then. So your personal view, do you feel that we should not trust the data on vaccines at the moment or not fully trust it? Take it with a pinch of salt. Yeah, absolutely think that, you know, it's like trust but verify for me. I, I really think that what journal clubs have taught us, what uh, evidence-based medicine has taught us uh, for decades now is, is to really get critical. And that's our job as academics, that's our job as health researchers. And I think access to data is fundamental to doing that. Is Adam Finn still there? Are you there, Adam? Or is he? Yeah, I'm here, but on a train, so it's a bit noisy. Okay. So very briefly, Peter said that we don't have full transparency of data, so we shouldn't fully trust the data on vaccine trials. So you're making your decisions based on incomplete information. Is that a fair analysis? Well, uh, we've got randomized controlled trials. We've got real world effectiveness studies. We've got more and more evidence accumulating. I think no evidence is ever perfect, uh, but you have to take the entirety of it. Uh, and while he's picked some holes in the studies, nothing's ever perfect, but you have to make decisions based on what you've got. Uh, I, I don't think that we've got any real doubts that these vaccines are effective at preventing people from getting sick with the amount of evidence we have now. Thank you. This, uh, you're going above and beyond there, Adam, speaking on the train. Thank you very much for all your contributions. Uh, Alison, you've been looking at all the questions we've been getting. What, what are your favourites so far? What would you like to kick off with? Hi, Phil. Well, I think Katie was going to play a few more of the questions from the children. Yes, indeed. Um, but, and then we've got some fab questions. You know, lots and lots of questions have come in and I'm happy to pick some of those if everybody's happy to run on a little bit longer. OK, Katie. Uh, I just have to check myself on mute. So yeah, the first question here is from Lily. Hi, my name is Lily Norman and I'm 16 years old. I'd like to know the pros and cons about the COVID vaccine and where you can find more information. So there's a big question about information there, Phil. How, how, how can young people find out about the information? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very clear, isn't it, that people want that information and young people want and deserve to be involved in the decision and they can be competent from the age of 12 upwards to make that decision where do they get the best information at the moment i guess adam might be on the train does anyone else want to pick up on this to say where would you advise uh, a young person offered a vaccine to get the best information on the pros and cons <laughs> russell are you I, still there is russell still there yes, i'm here oh. and in fact i was i was going to come in so um, Lily um, is 16, so she's uh, eligible for the vaccination now. And I mean, the NHS website is the best place to get good information. I would say that if that for um, young people from 12 to 16 and young people 12 to 15 who have medical conditions are also eligible for the vaccine, I think there is a lack of really good young person focused uh, information. Um, and that we should be challenging uh, the system to make sure that that's out there. But the NHS website has good information. So okay. it's Shemez over here. Can I just also add that the gov.uk website, which used to be a PHE website before, always prepares material before any vaccine is implemented. There are documents for healthcare workers, there are documents for clinicians and, the doctor, and there are documents for the public. There are posters available. 
if you search gov.uk for teenage vaccines, you will find that information before the vaccine is even implemented. And that's for any vaccine that is in the program. And a lot of effort goes into trying and developing material, age appropriate material. And that's been done for all the programs that are there. So you will find on gov.uk information about 16 to 17 year olds and for, and for the younger ones with underlying medical conditions. Thank you, Shamas. Does anyone else want to come in on that or are we moving on? Can I just um, just add to that? I know that with 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 Lily's point, it was she was saying that basically when you get the the, the flu vaccine at school, it comes with a leaflet um, and choice. When you get the HPV um, vaccine, again you get a leaflet, and um, I think that was the point. Rather than at the moment, young people going to have to find that information, they they're wondering why they're not just getting it um, to, before they make a choice. I think that's a very good point uh, you're making because actually you want to have time to consider and digest and ask questions rather than when you're in the heat of five minutes before your vaccine being handed some information that makes it much harder to make a, an informed choice. Thank you for that, Lily. That's an excellent question. What's our next question? Luca. My brother has type 1 diabetes and epilepsy, so he already has a vulnerable immune system. What should he do? Have a vaccine or not? But then what should I do? Should I have it to protect him? Or am I better off just not having it? Thank you. Kids ask the toughest questions, don't they? He's brave enough to take that one on. Who would like to go first? I'm happy to try. Go on then, Russell. Um, so a uh, great question from Luca. Um, I see a lot of uh, young people with type one diabetes. So <clears throat> I think we know for that COVID itself is, is little risk to children and young people unless they have very severe immune problems. I know we're talking about vaccination here, but it's balancing the risks. Um, I think my, our advice would be to have the vaccine. Um, it's very unlikely that there would be um, any additional or other problems because of his other uh, medical conditions. And certainly for other young people, if Luca is over 16 at the moment, um, yes. Uh, we'd certainly advise him to have the vaccine. And have you formed a view yet, Russell, on, on 12 to 15 year olds? I mean, he's saying he wants to protect his brother and we know most or a lot of transmission occurs in the household. And if his brother is deemed necessary to have a vaccine, do you think there's an argument for Luca having one if he's 12 to 15? And the JCVI certainly um, allows vaccination of younger children, uh, 12 to 15 year olds, I believe, if, um, if there are adults or older, older siblings with, with, with who are highly clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, I, I didn't think we were gonna quite get into our opinions on vaccinating 12 to 15 year olds yet. Um, you don't have to answer any of my questions, Russell. You should say, no, I don't want to answer that. That's fine. <laughs> okay, uh, that, that was really good. Anyone else want to comment um, on that? Yeah, it's Adam here. Oh, hi, Adam. Um, so the, the current most recent recommend, most re I'm hoping you're hearing me. The most recent yes. recommendations for 12 healthy uh, for the 12 to 15 year olds, I'm sorry, are, do include type one diabetes, um, and also healthy 12 to 15 year olds who, as Russell just said, are living with someone who is severely immunosuppressed. This particular brother would not be considered severely immunosuppressed. So I would advise the brother to receive the vaccine as advised, but I don't think Luca uh, needs it unless he's age of 15. Okay, can you still hear me, Adam? Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Are you still there? Uh, I work with kids with ME, CFS, who've often had a very unpleasant reaction to a virus, often Epstein virus, that gave them their ME. And they keep asking if they can have it. Why, why are they not considered a special uh, group of patients? Uh, they've not been identified actually as being at increased risk of getting uh, severe COVID. Um, okay. And uh, so at this point, then they're not on the list of for those that we're recommending the vaccine for in terms of risk and benefit. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Adam. What's our next uh, question? Unless anyone else wants to come in and answer Luca's question. Uh, no? Okay, let's go back to our third question then, Katie. What's our third question? Um, next is Stacey. Okay. Why is the AstraZeneca vaccine not recommended for children under the age of 18? Oh. Now, we've only had uh, Adam and Russell so far, and they may be in the, the frame for this, but does anyone else want to answer that? Um, 
I can <laughs> do that if you like. Uh, yeah, so uh, let's see if I can actually. It's Shemez. Uh, okay, go for it, Shemez. You go for it. It's a bit easier than the other one, so I'm jumping in. So there is a small but significant risk of bleeding and clotting with the first dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine, which seems to increase with younger age. Uh, when the vaccine was being deployed in, in older adults, uh, there was very careful uh, risk-benefit analysis to be done to identify the age above which the benefits of this vaccine outweigh the rare risks of the bleeding and the clotting. Uh, which is known as vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombocytosis, or VIT. Uh, below that age, because COVID doesn't cause severe disease in younger adults and in children, uh, the, the, the small risks of vaccination do not outweigh the, the benefits of vaccination. And therefore, different countries have different age cutoffs, but generally they are in the range of 40 to 60 years. Below that, because younger adults don't get severe COVID, it's not worth the risk of giving AstraZeneca vaccine because we have so many. Oh, we may be just slightly losing Shamas there, but I think we got that answer and thank you very much. I'm, I'm done. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks, Shamez. Uh, Alice, there were some three really good questions from young people there that put us on the spot. Uh, what are you, what's your next question, Alison? Was, are you done or is there a next question? There's, there's one more left. Oh, there are four other. I do apologise. What's the fourth one, Katie? Sorry. Hey, last but no means least, it's Kitty. Go on, Kitty. Are you aware of there being any specific side effects for young people who have had the vaccine versus those who have not? Ah, ah. well, I guess we might be talking about the most severe one, which would be the myocarditis. Um, who would like to answer that? It's Adam here. Um, so the, the most common problems relate to short-term um, reactions, which are very common after having had the vaccine that's being offered to young people, particularly after the second dose. Uh, people very commonly get some fever, um, headache, uh, and just feel pretty bushed for the first day or two, um, but then they get better. So that's, that's the clear side effects that we know about that happen all the time. This uh, concern around inflammation of the heart or myocarditis or pericarditis is extremely rare and it's, uh, it's still really only beginning to be understood. Um, but it is something that we are seeing with this vaccine that we don't see in unvaccinated people. It is worth saying, though, that if you get serious COVID, that also makes you very sick and can affect your heart as well. Um, but uh, that is a particular side effect that we're trying to understand better. Thank you. Is the, Adam, is the risk of myocarditis much higher if you get COVID, given that it's pretty much running free at the moment? Is, are you more likely to get myocarditis with the infection rather than the vaccine? Uh, certainly, if you're an adult, that seems to be the case. There, there are two studies, both of them not really very good studies in some ways, but, uh, but adults who get serious COVID can certainly get inflammation of the heart. We don't really have data in children, but colleagues have not really seen it in children with acute COVID. But children who get the pims ts the inflammatory syndrome, can occasionally also have their heart affected. That's a very rare syndrome as well. So this isn't the major problem for children who get COVID. Most children with COVID get a very mild illness. Okay. Thank you very much, Adam. Again, you've gone above and beyond and enjoy the rest of your journey. Uh, thanks for joining us. We may come back to you, so stay tuned if you can. Uh, okay, those four really good questions uh, and some good answers too. Uh, Alison, what's uh, what other? We've had loads of questions. We can't answer them all, I'm afraid, but what are you going for first, Alison? Well, I, again, I suppose it's building on this big challenges of data. Um, Dr. Grant's asking exactly uh, when will we have... He's having difficulty getting data on the adverse events for different age groups for the vaccine and for COVID disease. How and when will we know if we have enough data to understand what the real risks and benefits are? So this is about the unknowns, I guess, and the studies being done. Okay, so we had some clues from Peter, who said some of the studies weren't complete until maybe 2025. Are you still there, Peter? 
No, yes, no. Yeah, Peter is still there, yes. Where, how and when? If someone's really trying their hardest to do proper informed decision making, when will they have all the data they need for age specific side effects? Well, if we're talking about trials, that's that's still many months off, depends on, on the manufacturer, but it's many months or, or years off uh, if, if the timetable that's currently been laid out holds. If we're talking about uh, post-marketing adverse events, those data sort of are, are available now immediately, both yellow card and I think even a better system VARES because it allows for access to case reports. We can get access to those now age specific. Um, there's areas definitely for more transparency about the investigations uh, into data. And actually the question just now about myocarditis, uh, there, that study, I think it was in one of the talks today, uh, analyzing the risk of myocarditis versus after vaccine versus after natural infection. Uh, and in this case with uh, younger people finding that the risks were higher uh, uh, post-vaccine. That was actually analysis that uh, was done using the post-marketing adverse event data bears uh, system in the US. So some data is already available. If you're talking about high quality sort of trial placebo controlled data, that's gonna take uh, much longer unless you know demands get greater. And again, is it easy to find? So if someone's just generally interested, we talked about websites to get the best information. Where are the websites to get the best data if you're just a concerned citizen? I, I don't think that, that the, the systems right now, like the VARA system or yellow card, uh, I don't think that the systems uh, like Health Canada and EMA have uh, put up for uh, the, uh, the, the trial that that side. Side. of those are pr presenting. Yeah, we could have put your back on that side so you could sit on this side. Oh, we can still hear you, Shamas. You'll have to mute yourself a second so Peter can speak. Oh, I'm so sorry. That's right. Um, can I just add to that answer? I think it's really important to understand what information comes from where. Clinical trials generally contain a few thousand uh, participants, and therefore you can do your acute uh, adverse events such as pain, fever, uh, uh, rashes, and so on quite easily after vaccination. When you Looking at rare outcomes, you really need uh, very large populations with the data. So you do need post-marketing surveillance. And the problem with that is in the beginning, you don't know what you're looking for. And therefore, it's not very obvious that people are going to report everything and, and assume it's related to the vaccine. It's only when you start getting a signal that you can do more analysis to try and see whether that signal is a genuine adverse event or not. Um, and when you do that, one of the critical things is how well is the reporting for you to be able to uh, to be convinced that you are capturing all the cases because it's a very passive reporting system in hundreds of thousands of people. So even with myocarditis, the risk was something like 50 per million in the US, but the Israelis who have a much smaller population were reporting risks of between one in 3,000 and one in 6,000. So even when you have the data, it takes a long time to be confident that the system is working and the people who are trying to report this thing understand what they're reporting and then to analyze the data. So uh, pandemic has changed everything because these are not the type of data that come into public domain as fast as they are right now. So most of the information are actually in academic preprints, which also makes it difficult to decide on the quality of it until it is published. So I think for the, for the general public, it's very, very hard to get real-time data when uh, the, the people making the decisions are also struggling to get hold of the same data. Thank you. That's very helpful, Shamos. Thank you. Does anyone else want to comment on that point? I, I just want to add... Oh, you're back on, Peter. Yes. <laughs> I, I wanted to add on that. I think, I think it's actually a great point about the myocarditis because the adverse event occurs within days of dosing, um, but it, it's taken months, you know, months to really get on the radar through our pharmacovigilance systems and acknowledge as an adverse event. So the, 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 the timeline of when the adverse event occurs in the person is a very different timeline than the timeline of pharmacovigilance analysis, uh, dissemination of information. And, and I think that, and which ultimately impacts decisions. So I think it's important to understand the different timelines. That's very helpful as well. Thank you, Peter. Uh, what's the next question, Alison? Well, it's uh, one for, uh, again, transparency. How can I find out what information and data 
the JCVI took into account when they recommended an expansion of the list of conditions, the Annex A conditions. I don't know whether Adam's still around or somebody can answer that quickly. Have you got to Digcott Parkway yet, Adam? <laughs> <laughs> Can people find the data that you use to make your decisions on the JCPI is the question, Adam. I don't know if you can hear that now. And where can they find it? Or where can they find it? No, I think we've probably lost him for now. Uh, can anyone else, does anyone broadly know that? Uh... It's Shemez. So the way the JCVI works is that they get a lot of information uh, directly from the organizations that provide the information. So He's gone as well. So interesting. As soon as we start asking Over the last questions. month, every pharmaceutical company. Okay. Okay, so Shamas is dipping in and out. Can anyone else give us some idea where the JCVI gets its data and whether that manufacturing COVID vaccines has reported directly to uh, have I missed the question? No, you just I, I, uh, faded sorry, out back. a bit, yeah, Shamas, sorry. I missed the question. You, you faded out while you were speaking, so we're still slightly puzzled as to whether the public can get access to the same information the JCVI uses, was the question. Hi, it's Shamas. I apologize. Yeah. If you repeat the question, I'll try and answer it properly. Did you Did want you... to come in, Peter? Okay. If you... so, okay, so I'll try and summarize. So. The JCVI has a lot of information that's not in the public domain because it's just too quick to come into the public domain. The pharmaceutical companies. They must be blocking it. Okay, so the pharmaceutical companies are clearly blocking you speaking. Peter, yeah. can you just quickly come in? Um, what's oh, your name? Uh, and Adam can too, if you Adam. Uh, sorry, I just went into a tunnel at the critical moment. Um, so JCVI was. Are you hearing me okay? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. JCVI benefited from a series of studies done, uh, coordinated by a team from the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health with Russell, uh, as well as Pick and Net, which is the, uh, the, the, the coordinated group of intensive care units across the UK for children. So we have really quite good and accurate epidemiological data on uh, how many children get admitted to hospital with COVID caused by COVID. And importantly, that group took a lot of trouble to actually look at these cases and uh, evaluate the likelihood of causation. Uh, so they got independent opinions from clinicians on each of the severe cases. So we've really got really quite good information on the uh, likelihood of serious illness in children in the UK, if that and can the public get access to that, Adam, that information? Oh, uh, yes, all very expeditiously uh, published uh, as preprints and now I think coming through as, uh, as peer-reviewed papers, yeah. Uh, JCV obviously gets cited data before it hits the public domain quite frequently, uh, but all of the data produced by Public Health England and by other academic groups uh, goes into the public domain uh, as fast as possible, yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful and reassuring. Uh, Alison, have you got yeah. a question for someone else? Here's another one um, that maybe Rustin and um, Christine could answer. Um, it's this idea of age cutoffs. Do adolescents have such different immune systems to children that vaccines for these age groups need to be investigated separately? So I guess it's about risk and immunity. Yes. So the uh, age Dependence on infection is a really interesting puzzle. So typically, a lot of infections are worse in older people, but in younger people, sometimes the infection is worse in the very young, and it actually shows a sort of J or U-shaped pattern. And sometimes it's simply very mild in the very young and simply increases very gradually. And we don't know the reasons for this. Uh, and as I sort of briefly mentioned, on top of that, there's the effect of maternal antibodies. So it's really, um, yeah. So maybe Christine has something to add to that. Aston, when you talk about maternal antibodies, are you saying they're conferring short-term immunity or long-term immunity for the short, baby? Short-term, usually short-term immunity. Essentially, when we're when infants are born, they have quite a lot of IgG from 
their mothers. And this confers short-term protection, but this immunoglobulin wanes and its half-life is about two to three weeks. So it provides protection for a few months and maybe a few critical months. Uh, Christine, did you want to come in too? Yes, please. So if I understood the question correctly, it was whether we need separate studies or separate con con considerations for adolescents compared with children. And I think that in my point of view, it's more or less the same arguments you could put forward for adolescents as for children. They also still have quite mild disease. And I think that uh, Rustam's data nicely showed us how uh, allowing more circulation of the virus actually in the society will speed up the transition transition to endemicity. So, so in fact, I could see a case for discussing whether or not, um, but at least open the discussion to whether we need to vaccinate people maybe up to the age of 25 or 30 even, uh, given the low risk of severe disease in these age groups and the, the benefits from acquiring natural immunity uh, in these people who pass the infection and, and the rapid transition, as I, I mentioned, to endemicity. Do we know, uh, Christine, why children and young people are at much lower risk? Is it just good luck? Because with my simplistic non-expert head on, I'd have thought they have really good immune systems and so the immune overreaction to the virus could be very high. And I was quite surprised they were so mildly affected. Do we know why that is? There are several uh, pieces of information that point us in, in several directions, I should say. But one of them is that uh, children apparently have a better in, uh, intranasal uh, immunity and mucosal immunity towards uh, the virus in the first place. And secondly, that they might have more uh, energetic innate immune systems that may respond more uh, and, and reduce the, the initial viral load. And, and thirdly, also that uh, exposure to other human coronaviruses may pr provide some cross protection against infection. So, so all uh, maybe also uh, working together, uh, pointing in the direction that children are better equipped to handle these infections uh, while, while young. Okay, thank you. Would anyone else like to comment on that point? Just Russell. very briefly, Phil, um, Alison asked about the immune systems of 12 to 15 year olds and whether they're very different. And I think one of the, we, we tend to, to, we recognize that children aren't small adults, but we tend to assume that adolescents are are uh, just small adults often. The immune system during adolescence often changes dramatically. There's a real shift in autoimmunity. There's a peak age of onset of autoimmune conditions such as type one diabetes, certain arthritis. There's, there's, a, there's a change in the development of almost every body system. The actual development of all body systems during adolescence is, is not as great as in the first year of life, but it's the, it's the second greatest period of development. So we assume they are like adults at our peril. Okay, that's a very good point as well. Yeah, Emma, you wanted to come in. I did, I wanted to come in on two points. By, um, uh, in my day job, I'm an endocrinologist. And of course, the big thing that happens during puberty that marks out um, adolescents from children is that they go through puberty and that their, their hormonal milieu changes dramatically. And I think this speaks to Russell's point about autoimmunity and a host of other things changing. It is of course a completely arbitrary definition to say that somebody who is 17 and 364 days is regarded as a child and 18 and one day is regarded as an adult. And to believe that somehow your health is going to change dramatically overnight because of some, some, some definition. This is a gradual change that happens. And I think Christine's point that, that we are making decisions about children adolescents and young 20s this is a continuation of growth um, and and the big change that happens uh during the teen years is is this this change in one's in one's uh, sex hormone profile the second thing i just wanted to say was christine's point about reaction to other uh, viruses and how children might react I mean, for for the i'm sure that there are many clinicians in the audience and there are many parents in the audience who would comment that convalescence in children is generally shorter for a whole host of things not just this particular illness or other infections but also after surgery and a host of other things children uh, that they heal at different rates to the way that um, adults and older adults heal for a host of reasons that's very helpful thank you very much for that emma uh, i think probably one more question alison <laughs> Um, well, this one's uh, perhaps one that everybody's been thinking about hard, um, but maybe you can ask everybody their views. Uh, Bruce Pike asks, how childhood vaccination against COVID can be justified, especially now we know naturally acquired immunity confers greater protection than a vaccine? That's what he's asking. How do you justify it? Okay, does everyone want to have a go at that? Can childhood vaccination now be justified given that we've learnt that natural immunity confers better and more lasting protection? Who'd like to go first? 
that forces you to take a position, I guess. Yes, good old Adam. <laughs> Go on, Adam. Oh, he's put his hand up and now we're just, have we gone in a tunnel again? Okay, Christine, you're smiling. So can you give us, well, I know what your view on this, but do you think it can be justified based on the evidence we've heard today? Oh, I, I can go first because I think I made my, my point quite clear during my presentation. I don't think it can be justified to vaccinate healthy children at this stage. Are they doing it in Denmark? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And do you get inflammatory emails because of your position? A few. <laughs> okay. Adam, uh, what's your position? Okay, his hand's up, but I can't hear him. Peter, you want to go next? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Christine in, in terms of position uh, on vaccinating children. But I just wanted to add to this uh, a statistic that came up, again, one of the presentations, but we didn't spend much time on it, but I think is really important, which is that a very substantial minority uh, perhaps given uh, Delta's rate of transmission, uh, a majority uh, now or in the near future of children may already have been infected, most of which were asymptomatic, presumably. Um, those are the official data, yet a lot of these discussions about shall I get the vaccine or not seem to be happening in the absence of any sense of whether that individual has had the infection naturally. And I think that's a, a huge consideration that needs a bit more attention. And so I don't know for other people on the call, can they speak to how can people get good information about their own immunity status while they're making this kind of decision? Okay, who'd like to answer that? Uh, Shemez has come in again. He's very good at coming. Emma, let's get Emma first and then you, Shemez. Emma, would you like to go first? I think this is a question which I don't really uh, think that we currently have an answer to because measuring an antibody level does not necessarily, that does not measure all of an immune reaction either to a natural infection or to a vaccine. And I don't think yet we know whether there is a threshold level above which you can say somebody is immune and below which you can say somebody is not. And, uh, and, and to rely entirely on antibodies to give an indication of, um, uh, of infection. I wanted to come back to your question also, Phil, if I may, about what one's position is. I have to say, I came into this with one view and listening to everybody has changed my view, which I think is actually the whole point of the exercise, to listen respectfully. Um, and I think that the, the thing which was most compelling to me is that we are unlikely to eradicate this worldwide. And we may need to answer this question in terms of short-term, medium-term and long-term decisions rather than a black and white decision. That a decision about vaccinating adults and vaccinating all adults worldwide, particularly healthcare workers and older people, um, as was presented so eloquently by Shredar from the point of view of our global responsibility and global citizens, may well be an overwhelming argument if we can have that mindset collectively as a community rather than vaccinating particularly younger children. If we just finally, if we had enough vaccines globally, do you think we should move on to informed choice? So say to young people, here are the benefits, here are the risks, here are the unknowns, here, here's what would happen if we didn't vaccinate you, here's our safety net if something goes wrong and let you make the choice. So instead of saying, we don't think there's enough evidence for a mass vaccination problem, allow individuals with chronic fatigue syndrome or whatever at the age of 13 to make their own decision. Do you think informed choice is the way forward? I think that's a very difficult question. And I think it's true, not just with respect to the vaccine, but it's true about medicine taking generally. Um, at what point do you regard a child as having adequate autonomy um, understanding of the short and the long-term benefits. And we, and we make this, this is a discussion that I think you have to have in context with parental responsibility. So uh, I think that that's a question I'm going to say, at what point do we transition autonomy uh, in a family to a child making its own decisions? Um, and, and we make those decisions at sometimes with respect to blood transfusions where a child, uh, where, and there are sometimes there are decisions, uh, there, there are other points at which a child can go against their parents' wishes. But for younger children, generally parental autonomy is regarded as the best judge of a situation. Uh, I mean, a five-year-old isn't really in the position to understand a lot of the data we've presented, whereas a 15-year-old would. So I think it's a, I, I think it's a graded answer, Phil, rather than a definite answer. Okay, would anyone else like to come in before we wind up? We've gone slightly beyond time, so I'm very conscious of that. It's been an extraordinarily good and rich discussion with lots to take away and chew over. And of course, available uh, on the website.
the uh, BMJ website if you want to uh, dip into it again and think and reflect on what you've learned. Uh, I think the next one is on the 8th of October and somebody's going to tell me what the topic is again because I've slightly forgotten. It's another really good topic. What is it? The next one, Fiona. Over uh, to you. It's um, the origins of COVID. Ah. And I'm and not just, let me just check that date. What did, did we say that was the date? David? I've said the 8th of October, but I slightly made that up. You're going to now clarify. Well, I just don't know. No, it's the 7th of October. <laughs> October. And can it's you tell us what the origin of COVID is, Fiona? Because you would know. As the origin of COVID. Um, no, I'm going to remain absolutely neutral, uncertain, and um, level-headed headed on the origin of COVID. Have you changed your mind after this debate, Fiona? You don't have to say what you've changed it to, but have you altered your position at all? Um, I feel a better informed in my uh, my um, readiness to accept further data. I do think the access to data is a really big thing, and I'm yeah. delighted to hear about the transparency from JCVI. But I'm sure that Peter will say that's not adequate. So we're looking at levels of transparency that we'd all like to see. Um, but it's been a really fascinating and informed and, and wonderfully balanced debate. So I'm really grateful to everyone for joining us for it. Okay, we can all leave now. Thank you. Have a pleasant evening. And uh, thanks. Thanks, Bill. thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye bye.